It takes a couple of attempts, but you manage to spark up a lighter and hold it up steadily in front of your face to light up a joint. A familiar woody smell fills the room and drifts out of your window on the afternoon breeze. You blink, steady yourself, inhale deeply, and fill your lungs up with warmth. But what happens next? Chemically speaking, biologically speaking, what is it about this little green plant that gets millions of people around the world to flock to it? How long has humanity been consuming it? And what exactly is it doing inside your body, inside your mind? To start, let's have a look at the chemical composition of the cannabis plant itself rolled up in a joint in your hand. Native to Central and South Asia, the cannabis plant today is so popular, it's now grown to be a global economy of its own. From small-scale rural farming operations all the way through to drug super labs, including any number of illegal weed farms somewhere in the middle. Experts believe that there are well over 700 different strains of cannabis currently on the market, and this number seems only set to increase. Being able to identify which strain of weed you have in your hand can be very easy when buying from a legal dispensary, but if you live in a country or a state where marijuana is still criminalized, being able to verify exactly what it is you're smoking becomes more difficult. Looking down at the green mossy balls in your hand, do you know where in the world it's come from and what's inside it? Let's break it down a bit, or rather, grind it down. You've likely heard of the two most well-known active ingredients in cannabis. These are cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, or as you probably know them, CBD and THC. Over the last 10 years, in the West in particular, CBD has been championed as a potential medical breakthrough. It's also been shown to have a calming effect on those with anxious disorders and is currently being tested as a treatment for psychosis, sleep disorders, muscle spasticity, and more. You might have seen ads for CBD oil products popping up in your feed claiming that it can solve any number of ailments. Research is ongoing, however. Results vary. In the case of curing cancer, for example, so far there's no evidence to support that CBD has any kind of effect on the disease, despite what people on the internet might be saying. So, you smoke CBD to get high, right? No, CBD is usually extracted as an oil, and on its own it will not get you high. But it's still psychoactive, meaning it alters your mental state, typically leaving you feeling more calm and mellow. The feeling of being high comes from the main active component in marijuana, THC. Typically found in much greater quantities than CBD, THC can have a powerful psychoactive effect. To see what that means in practice, let's follow it as it enters the human body. You take in a deep breath of that joint and let the smoke fill your lungs. In this example, you're going to be our test subject, and you will be smoking weed. Smoking is one of the most direct and quickest ways to get high. This is because the smoke from your burning marijuana contains high levels of THC. The smoke is then inhaled, filling your lungs. At this point, you might experience some irritation manifesting in the iconic smoker's cough from introducing an alien substance into your lungs. This, however, is not unique to smoking weed as you're likely to see the same from people smoking or vaping conventional tobacco. The lungs are designed to quickly and efficiently transfer oxygen into the bloodstream when we breathe. Therefore, they have the capacity to take in large quantities of gas in one breath and get any number of elements or compounds from that gas into our bloodstream and fast. The lungs aren't just empty chambers, they're full of tiny little air pockets called alveoli. The average human adult has roughly 480 million alveoli in their lungs constituting about 1,500 miles of airways. That's the equivalent of driving from Miami to New Hampshire for our American viewers or Madrid to Copenhagen for our European viewers. For everyone else, it's roughly 13,636,363.6 bananas lying end to end. Anyway, back to your lungs. In each alveolus, the THC from the smoke is transferred directly into your bloodstream, which then carries it all over your body, including to the critical area, your brain. As a result, it often only takes a matter of seconds for the user to start feeling the psychoactive effects of what they're smoking. So, let's crack your head open and see what's going on inside. Sorry, this might hurt a little. The THC and CBD bind themselves to receptors throughout your brain. The amygdala, for example, is responsible for anxiety, emotional responses, and fear. CBD dulls the activity in this part of the brain, but the THC component can stimulate it. While many users feel calmer after having smoked weed, Others can feel a heightened sense of paranoia and worry, particularly on the come down as the calming effects of the CBD wear off. Looking at other parts of the brain impacted by the CBD, we have the basal ganglia, which is involved with motor control and planning, the neocortex, which processes sensory information, and the cerebellum, which is the center of motor control. All three of these areas are impacted by smoking weed, resulting in you feeling slower in general. Reflexes are delayed, information takes more time to process, and motor functions and speech slow down. 
Driving under the influence of marijuana can be very dangerous as a result. One study in the UK found that fatal accidents are 1.65 times more likely to occur when the subject is under the influence of marijuana, while another study in Canada found that accidents could be to four times as likely. Most countries have strict laws for driving under the influence of weed with zero tolerance policies, made stricter by the fact that it can take over 48 hours for weed to stop showing up on a blood test. If they're testing your saliva, it can be up to 72 hours. Urine can be anywhere from 3 to 30 days, and it can even be tested in your hair follicles for up to 90 days. Fortunately, you won't find many traffic cops that are plucking out your arm hair for a routine traffic stop. However, it would be reductive to think that all weed does is dull your brain. THC is a very active component that stimulates a lot of neural activity. Colors look brighter, sounds are louder, music sounds more rich and layered. Food often tastes better under the influence of THC, giving the subject the illusion that they're really hungry. That's right, this is why so many people using cannabis experience the famous munchies, which is why having a stoner visit your home is potentially extremely dangerous to the state of your snack pantry and chip supply. Many people report having heightened imagination, being able to think outside the box or come up with fresh and exciting ideas. Artists all throughout history have partaken in recreational drugs in an attempt to broaden their horizons, dulling a lot of the negative sensations, such as feeling pain and anxiety, coupled with the stimulation from THC, results in feelings of euphoria. In short, you, our human test subject, have gotten high. But what does this high actually look like? Here's where it gets really interesting. Let's bandage your head up and take a look. So far, we've only focused on the THC and CBD, but there are hundreds of active components within cannabis, which vary in quantity and intensity depending on which of the hundreds of strains the user is consuming. On top of that, there's the method of consumption. While smoking or vaping gets the chemicals into the bloodstream quickly, the high only lasts around three hours or so. Many users instead take gummies or bake brownies and cookies. When weed is absorbed through the digestive system, it takes a significantly longer time to kick in, but when it does, the user can experience highs that go on for hours, even up to a day, as the digestive system slowly releases the chemicals into the bloodstream. All of this makes studying the effects of marijuana very difficult. As with almost any study, there are the caveats of which strain is being used, how the test subject is ingesting it, and who the test subject is. The human brain is an incredibly complex thing indeed. If you took a sample of the human brain that was the size of just one grain of sand, that sample would contain 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. Now multiply that by 860,000 and you've got a human brain, just like the one that's sitting in your head, watching this video and feeling very smug about itself. Being able to quantify and measure exactly what's happening in an organ far more advanced and complicated than the computers we're studying it on has been a challenge in medical science for decades and will likely continue to be one for a very long time. While one individual might take one puff and spend the rest of the day feeling anxious, their elderly grandma might smoke a whole bowl and feel nothing but zen. So for Nana's sake, is it dangerous? Well, on the whole, consuming marijuana is relatively harmless as long as you aren't driving, controlling heavy machinery, or performing open-heart surgery, the risks of smoking the occasional joint with the right amount of weed in it are low. So, why hasn't it been legalized worldwide already? And why are there skeptics out there, including in the scientific community? As is often the case with controversial topics, a lot of the conflict comes from political and cultural differences. To tell that whole story, we need to wind all the way back to China in 2800 BC, where we find the first recorded use of marijuana in history. Even that long ago, the cannabis plant was being used for medicinal purposes. Emperor Shen Nong, considered by many to be the grandfather of medicine, recorded the plant in his writings as being particularly useful. From that point, records of cannabis spread throughout India, Syria, Greece, and Rome. Various healing properties have been ascribed to it over the years, including cures for inflammation, depression, arthritis, and even asthma. Of course, most early medicine is notoriously rather unreliable. We're looking at you leeches and milk transfusions. But there's always been something about this little green plant that's captured the attention of doctors and pharmacologists throughout the centuries. Often there's a grain of truth to the mythology that has sprung up around the drug. In Hinduism, for example, the god Shiva is given the title of Lord of Bong because cannabis is his favorite food. For centuries, many Hindus believed that if you were suffering from a fever, it was the god's hot breath of anger upon you. Rituals were conducted where you would be given a quantity of cannabis to consume so you would find favor with Shiva again and your fever would pass. With modern medical science, we know that THC acts in the hypothalamus of the brain, reducing the body's temperature and therefore counteracting fevers. So, where did it all go wrong for Weed's PR team? 
Why is it that many people in the West now include cannabis in the same conversation as crack, cocaine, and heroin, as opposed to paracetamol and penicillin? Well, medical marijuana was first introduced in the West in 1841 by William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, an Irish physician who spent years studying all kinds of different medicines in India. But the real origins of the USA's problem with marijuana began 200 years before that, in the Jamestown colony in 1605. Dissatisfied with the return on investment they were seeing, the English, and King James I in particular, demanded the colony change up the crop they produced to hemp, a plant within the cannabis family. The crop was a massive success and became the key to the early expansion of the American colonial settlements. George Washington himself famously grew hemp as one of his three primary crops on Mount Vernon. The plant was used to manufacture ropes and fabrics, but following William Brooke O'Shaughnessy's findings from India, Americans began to experiment with the plant's medicinal properties. The USA was still in relative infancy, with many laws and prohibitions being established. Drug laws at the time involved labeling products as being poisons, which restricted them to being legal only if prescribed by a pharmacist. Even then, the debate about cannabis varied from state to state, with some issuing it with the poison status and others believing it was exempt from these rules. At the time, opium dens were rife across America, and alongside them a number of hashish parlors popped up in which people would smoke various forms of hemp and cannabis. By 1880, these establishments were seen as quite fashionable, with many of the upper classes frequenting them. It's estimated that there were roughly 500 such parlors in New York City alone. The laws needed to be strengthened further still. Fraud and corruption were rife in the drug industry, with many falsely labeling their products for the sake of profit. The tighter that these restrictions got, the more people looked for loopholes. The government and the newly established Food and Drug Administration were pulling in different directions than a lot of the American public, who were looking to skirt prescriptions and drug laws in order to continue to get their highs. In the move to close the loopholes, cannabis was often grouped in with many of the much more addictive, much more harmful drugs that were plaguing the American population. The solution the American government came to was a zero-tolerance policy on recreational drug use, including the prohibition of alcohol and the criminalization of marijuana, which at the time they were spelling with an H. In 1971, President Nixon coined the term War on Drugs, where he declared drug abuse to be public enemy number one of the American people. The approach was incarceration with an iron fist. Possession, distribution, and consumption of banned substances would result in jail time. It's estimated that throughout this war on drugs, the USA spends roughly $51 billion annually on its endeavor to clean up the streets. To illustrate with that money, the USA could give each Canadian citizen $1,416.67 per year just as a little thank you for being such lovely neighbors. Alternatively, they could give one lucky Canadian a dollar a minute for 97,032 years. A large amount of this campaign against drugs has involved a level of fear-mongering. There's a lot of false information swirling around the world about the negative effects these drugs have. It rots the brain and causes psychosis. It's a gateway drug to stronger and more dangerous highs, and it is highly addictive. But is there any truth to any of these claims? Let's examine them one by one. Firstly, no, marijuana does not rot the brain. Rotting is the decay of dead organic material as bacteria and fungi consume it. That simply doesn't happen. However, the link to psychosis is a much more contested field with evidence for both sides of the argument. Firstly, what is psychosis? It's a term that is thrown around a lot, especially in the world of drug use, but very rarely defined, meaning a lot of people attach their own fears, worries, and prejudices to the word. Psychosis is when someone loses contact with reality. The image of the world around them that the brain is painting doesn't match up with the objective reality surrounding them. The two main symptoms of psychosis are hallucinations and delusions, and it's important to know the difference between the two. A hallucination is when a person experiences something that isn't actually happening. Most commonly, this takes the form of hearing voices that aren't really there or sometimes seeing things that aren't really there. In some cases, people have reported smelling, feeling, and tasting their hallucinations too, such as tasting blood in their mouth despite there being none. A delusion, on the other hand, is more abstract. It could be the feeling that you're being followed or that there's a conspiracy in your workplace to harm you. Delusional people are often highly susceptible to conspiracy theories, as often the paranoid messaging chimes with their fearful delusions that their minds have already been generating. So, does marijuana cause psychosis? It's complicated. Let's go back to the chemicals active in your brain. We're gonna need to crack that skull open again, sorry. THC is highly psychoactive. This is where the feeling of euphoria from being high comes from. 
While CBD can decrease the levels of panic and paranoia in the brain, it's often present in much smaller quantities than THC, mainly as many cannabis farms compete with one another to grow stronger and stronger strains. Couple that with the fact that there are hundreds of active compounds within the cannabis plant, and it goes back to our earlier point about this being a challenging area of study. Therefore, many scientists rely on quite broad studies, taking large sample sizes of drug users and non-drug users and comparing the development of their brains over time, looking most notably at teenagers and young people. What they found is there is often a link between heavy pot smoking and psychosis. There are cases of people living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders where the heavy use of marijuana is linked to the onset of those symptoms. What has not been proven, however, is that weed was the cause. Most scientists believe that weed can, in some cases, accelerate the development of underlying psychotic disorders. The brain is a very complex and delicate thing. If somebody has an underlying psychotic condition, then the consumption of drugs that alters their state of mind and heightens activities within certain sections of the brain can naturally lead to an exacerbation of those symptoms. Schizophrenia is believed to affect 1 in 300 people, while bipolar disorder affects 1 in 100. While these are quite small percentages, they are not insignificant. THC does carry the risk of triggering a psychotic episode if you're genetically predisposed to having a psychotic condition. The chances are very low and won't affect the majority of the population, but they are still there. Next, is it a gateway drug? The experience of a chemical buzz in the brain is a sensation that many of us try to chase in our lives. You get up and sing in a concert at your high school and you get a rush from it. You do it a second time and the high is worn off a bit. So you need a bigger crowd and a bigger crowd and suddenly you're in a rock band on an arena tour. Chasing this type of bigger, better high is an experience we're sure many of you are familiar with. Studies have shown that in a minority of cases, the same can happen with marijuana. Usage of the drug can prime the brain, ready for more intense highs, which it then craves. This sounds bad until you realize the same thing happens with cigarettes and alcohol. Both of these demonstrate a similar connection to being a gateway drug to harder substances as marijuana. So, why are those not held up to the same level of scrutiny? One thing studies have shown is that there is a much more powerful gateway drug out there, trauma. A difficult childhood, experiencing abuse, and going through acute pain and suffering are all far more likely to result in a person developing a dependence on hard substances. Weed is often a part of that journey, but in these cases it seems to be a symptom more than the cause of the problem. But is it addictive? Let's take a similar look at this question. You wake up one morning feeling tired, so you make yourself a cup of coffee. It clears away the fog, helps you focus on your job, and gives you a little endorphin rush from a good day's work. So the next day, you do the same, and the next, and the next, until one day you run out of coffee. You look in the jar and it's empty. A storm cloud gathers over your head. You go to work with a scowl, snap at your coworkers, have a headache by lunchtime, and come home feeling miserable. What's happened here? Well, the human brain is incredibly flexible. Your brain has gotten so used to the influx of caffeine each day that it's now rebalanced the chemicals inside itself to receive that caffeine boost. It's ready and it's waiting, so when the boost doesn't come, there's now a chemical imbalance. The same thing happens with weed. If you burn one down at 420, smoke weed every day, your brain's going to be sitting there at 419 rubbing its metaphorical hands together in anticipation. Coming off weed now feels hard. You have cravings for it, you feel irritated when you don't have it, you struggle to fall asleep, you lose your appetite, and you generally have a bad time. For about two weeks. Then you're likely back to normal. And that's because what we've described here isn't an addiction, it's dependence. It's very common and can be broken fairly quickly. Up to 30% of weed smokers experience some level of dependence, and it can be overcome by just taking an extended break and giving your brain some rest. That said, there's a small risk of long-term addiction. People under the age of 18 have brains that are still developing. They're still growing and changing and adjusting to the world around them. Smoking weed regularly at this stage in your life could lead your brain to building itself around the expectation that it'll be receiving those chemical hits every day, which may start as a dependence and could grow to be much more deeply rooted and could result in a lifelong addiction. If there's one thing you learned from this video, it's that marijuana, much like life, is complicated. There may not always be a straight answer to every question. Anyone who tells you that something is totally amazing and has no downsides will always be lying. Even ice cream has downsides. What's important is looking at the big picture. Is weed the devil's leaf that spells the end of society as we know it? No, of course not. 
but neither is it a miracle cure-all drug that everyone should take on a daily basis. Are you the kind of person that wakes up and always seems to feel tired? Sometimes you got 8 hours of sleep, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 5 hours, but never mind how well you think you slept, you always wake up feeling slightly groggy. Don't worry, you're not alone. Let's now attempt to put things right for you. While waking up for you is nothing special, a lot of things happen to your body when you awaken in the morning. For instance, your heart rate will get faster and your breathing will become quicker. Your blood flow will increase and your brain will start producing different kinds of brain waves. Your liver and kidneys during the night were in sleep mode, but when you awake, they go back to waking mode. You basically rev up for the day and when you open those eyes of yours, the lot of external stimuli will flood your blood. During the night, when you were in sleep mode, you'll have experienced something called RAM or rapid eye movement. Most people have about five of these periods during sleep, interspaced with non-REM sleep. If you want to know what REM looks like, just watch your dog's eyes flickering when it's enjoying some Z's. It's during these rapid eye movements when you dream and you're in what we call deep sleep. If you've ever woken up in the middle of a dream, you've woken up during REM. This is important for today's show because the experts say we need this deep sleep. Sometimes you might take a pill to sleep, and while you may think you've gotten a good night's sleep, the drugs may have affected how much real deep sleep you got. Let's say you didn't get down with enough REM. You'll likely know this because when you wake up, you'll feel tired and mightily irritable throughout the day. If this keeps happening, you'll get more irritable, and not getting enough sleep over a long period of time can actually affect affect your health, because when we sleep, our bodies go into repair mode. When we're sleeping, we're charging, and if you want to wake up feeling supercharged, then you have to get enough sleep. Dreaming is important too, it's like allowing your thoughts to spill out. It's kind of a psychological cleansing. So, we're told that the average adult should be getting 7-9 to nine hours of good sleep per night. Many of you will now be thinking, hmm, that's not me. Some of you will get that much sleep but still wake up tired. Now we're going to tell you how you can wake up feeling better. First of all, watch what you eat. You shouldn't eat a lot before you sleep, and if you've snacked on a bunch of processed carbs before bedtime, your blood sugar levels are going to be high and this can prevent you from having a good night's sleep. You should have plenty of water though, and we suggest you keep water near your bed. If you wake up dehydrated, it might not matter how many hours you've got, and you might still feel sluggish. Being dehydrated can slow you down. Another thing is to exercise. We're not asking you to start doing 5 mile runs every evening, but just move about a bit in the day. Exercise can oxygenate your blood and in turn this provides nutrients to your brain and heart. If you're someone who's very lazy, don't think you'll sleep better because you're so good at not moving. That's not the case at all. We shouldn't have to tell you this, but during the night, turn off alerts on your phone. You might think that you don't hear those beeps, but each beep might upset those deep sleep cycles your body so much enjoys. It's really Really not hard to turn off those alerts, so start doing it now. Another thing you might not have heard about is not hitting that snooze button. Small increments of sleep do nothing for you at all. It's that good sleep you want. If you enter into a new sleep cycle and then disrupt it after 10 minutes snooze, you're basically ruining that cycle. Your body doesn't like this. The experts tell us there's something called the 90 minute technique, which means setting your alarm 90 minutes before you really want to get up. It's like a long snooze. During those 90 minutes, you'll enter into a REM period and that's good for you. You could not press the snooze button at all, but some people think it's good to have that early wake-up call. When you wake up, the first thing you want to do is stretch. We mean put some effort into this, and not just do the arms in the air thing. Some people do some easy yoga moves. Why would you do this, you might wonder? The answer is because when you sleep, you're in a state of extreme relaxedness, which isn't far from paralysis. The word for this state is atony. You need to come out of this to feel fresh, but most people just saunter around in the morning. It's been proven that doing a few easy exercises in the morning stimulates your brain and endorphins start rushing in. This will make you feel happier and give you energy. On top of this, hit that cold water as soon as possible. In hot countries, a cold shower might be the thing to do in the morning, but that might not be possible when it's cold outside. Nonetheless, wherever you are, you should splash cold water on your face first thing, not hot water. Some experts say that you should keep a spray bottle next to your bed and spray yourself the moment you wake up. It's a short, sharp shock that will get you going. It might sound silly, but try it and tell us what you think. As for eating in the morning, well, these days a lot of people like to skip breakfast and fast, but there is research that tells us breakfast will give you energy in the morning and will provide you with the energy throughout the day. But if you look online, you'll find a lot of people 
people seem to cope with the day better not eating breakfast while others need their breakfast. We guess you should try both and see what works for you. If you do eat something though, don't go for the sugary stuff. If you do, your blood sugar will spike and then it will drop. You don't need this kind of hit as the come down will slow you down. As for caffeine, some studies have shown that a lot of caffeine can wear a person out later in the day. We're not saying don't drink coffee, but experiment with how you feel drinking certain amounts of it. Coffee before bed is a no-no. Most people think that a coffee a few hours before bed is okay, but the stuff has a half-life of 5-8 to eight hours. Make sure your last coffee is a long time before you plan to sleep. Believe it or not, some studies have shown that if the sun is out, then stick your head out the window and get some. We found a study called Vitalizing Effects of Being Outdoors and in Nature. It said participants felt refreshed just looking at nature. So open those curtains in the morning ASAP. If you get some sun on your face, that's good because sunlight can increase serotonin levels. Another thing you should do is some mental accounting first thing. It's simple. Tell yourself what you might find difficult in the day and how you might address that. It's a literal weight off your mind. Now comes the good part because then you should think of at least one thing you're looking forward to that day. People generally don't do this, but they should. It sets the day for you. Be clean. What we mean by this is don't go to bed feeling sweaty or dirty. It could affect how well you sleep. In many Asian countries, people always shower before bed, but it's not the same in other countries. Make sure you go to sleep in a clean and comfortable bed and when you wake up, make sure that you make that bed. Making the bed is like preparing for the day ahead. It shows that you're ready to face the day. On top of this, try to wake up at the same time each day so you maintain your circadian rhythm. If you've never heard of that, it's your sleep-wake cycle. The National Sleep Foundation tells us this about it. The more the more you pay attention to your body and notice feelings of alertness and drowsiness, and the more time you spend developing good sleep hygiene habits, the better your slumber will be and the better you'll feel. Your body just loves consistency and it will pay you back for it. Before you sleep, it's best not to play games or do anything that might stress you out. For the hour before bedtime, try and do something very relaxing, such as reading a book or just relaxing on the sofa. You shouldn't really be looking at screens right before bedtime because the lights can disrupt the production of melatonin in the brain and this chemical helps you sleep. We shouldn't have to tell you this one, but go to the bathroom before you sleep. Your bladder can fill up in the night and the feeling might wake you up, even if you don't go to the bathroom. You might not feel like you need to urinate, but you'd be surprised how often you can squeeze some out. Always hit the bowl before bed is our advice. Don't hang out in the bedroom before bedtime as much as possible. We know you might like to do this, but your brain should be associating that place with one thing, and that's sleeping. If your bedroom is your castle, you will subconsciously be more energized in that place and it'll be harder to sleep there. As for drinking alcohol, many of you will know that it can help you sleep. Still, it's said booze can interrupt REM sleep and do other bad things, such as give you nightmares. As the booze can relax throat muscles, it can also bring on a bout of snoring, which is not good for sleep. We're sure some of you can attest to the annoyingness of sleeping next to a drunk person. Booze in the system almost always fills the bladder, too, so a trip to the bathroom might be needed during a drunken sleep. Smoking is also not good for sleep, because nicotine increases heart rates and alertness. If you're super addicted, your body might also crave a smoke during the night and wake you up. If you're not willing to give up, we suggest at least trying not to smoke an hour before you go to bed. Colors might be important too. That's at least one study we found undertaken by Travel Lodge. It found that certain colors produced better sleep, and so that's why you might find hotel rooms often being painted or decorated in the same colors. The study found that blue, yellow, and green were the best colors for sleep, while the worst colors were purple and brown. Why? One expert said this. The color blue is associated with feelings of calm, which when picked up by your ganglion cells are relayed to your brain, and help reduce blood pressure and heart rate, all of which help you receive a solid night's sleep. So there you go. Paint the bedroom blue, don't drink booze, don't smoke, don't eat too much, and when you wake up, do so with purpose and move around a lot. Wash that face and open those windows. When he was just 12 years old, Martin Pistorius came down with a strange illness that puzzled his parents and doctors and left him in a coma. Doctors told his parents to prepare for the worst, but Martin clung to life in an apparently vegetative state for more than a decade. When Martin miraculously woke up from his coma 12 years later, he remembered everything. He had been trapped in his body, unable to communicate with the world going on around him, but fully aware of everything happening around him and to him for years. Martin's illness started out normally enough. He was suffering from headaches, nausea, and vomiting, symptoms that seemed to point to a common flu. But then, things took a turn for the worse. The formerly rambunctious preteen's personality completely changed. He seemed reserved, slept all the time, and eventually stopped talking and making eye contact altogether. Soon he was unable to feed himself, 
walk, or even get out of bed. Martin's parents took him to doctor after doctor, but they were just as confused as his parents were. There was no obvious reason for his symptoms, and nothing the doctors tried made Martin feel any better. In fact, he continued to get worse, first becoming wheelchair bound and eventually slipping into a coma. Martin's doctors were mystified. They weren't exactly sure what caused these mysterious symptoms, but their best guess was an extremely rare case of cryptococcal meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges, the membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. Cryptococcus neoformans, or CM for short, is an incredibly rare form of meningitis, usually diagnosed in people who have compromised immune systems. Early symptoms include headache, nausea, and vomiting, and mental changes like confusion and personality changes. If left untreated, CM can lead to brain damage, coma, and even death. The neoformans fungus that causes most cases of CM is found in soil all over the world particularly soil that contains bird droppings. If a doctor suspects CM based on the patient's symptoms, they'll perform a painful spinal tap to confirm the diagnosis. The infection can be treated with antifungal medication, which usually needs to be taken indefinitely. But since most people who contract CM are already immunocompromised, the infection can often be fatal. In Martin's case, his doctors believed that the infection had run rampant and caused his body to enter a coma state, which led them to believe that his prognosis was not good. After more than two years in a coma, the doctors told Martin's parents that he likely wouldn't ever wake up, and that if he did, he would likely have the mind of a three-year-old. They took him home, made him as comfortable as possible, and did their best to adjust to their new normal. A coma is a state of prolonged unconsciousness characterized by depressed brainstem reflexes. A comatose person's pupils will not respond to light, and their bodies show no response to painful stimuli. A coma can be caused by a head injury, a stroke, a brain tumor, or an underlying illness or infection, as in Martin's case. Most comas last only a few weeks and medical attention is crucial to preserving brain functioning even during that short time. If a coma lasts more than a few weeks, the patient will likely transition to a persistent vegetative state. After more than one year in a coma, it's highly unlikely that the person will wake up. Throughout Martin's ordeal, his parents' life revolved around caring for their comatose son. Every morning, Martin's father would wake up early to dress Martin before dropping him off at the care facility where he spent his days. Eight hours later, after a full day of work, his father would return to pick him up from the facility and bring him home. After bathing him and putting him to bed, Martin's father would set his alarm to go off every two hours so that he could get up and turn Martin over to help prevent bed sores. Their lives continued like this for more than a decade, with Martin's parents continuing to love and care for their son despite the fact that doctors had told them that the Martin they knew was gone. At best, they said he had the mind of a three-year-old, and if he was even aware at all. At least that's what they thought. Meanwhile, Martin was aware of everything that was going on around him. About two years after he fell into his coma, Martin's mind woke up, with his intellect fully intact, although the rest of his body remained immobile, and he was trapped in a body that couldn't move, speak, or even make eye contact. But Martin could hear and see everything that was going on around him, and he remembered everything. In one of the care facilities that he spent time at, the staff would dump him in front of a TV playing children's shows for hours on end. Day after day, he sat helpless in front of the TV, with nothing but reruns of the Barney and Friends TV show to focus on. To this day, Martin cannot overstate how much he hates Barney. But annoying kids shows were the least of the abuses he experienced. Everyone around Martin, his parents, his doctors, and the caretakers watching over him all believed that Martin was in a vegetative state, unaware of his surroundings and unable to speak up or protect himself. For some monstrous individuals, Martin appeared to be the perfect victim, helpless, silent, and oblivious, and the way they treated him was truly shocking. Martin remembers every detail of the abuse he experienced at a care facility after care facility. Some of the caregivers seemed to get a little too much enjoyment from the act of testing his response to painful stimuli. He remembered being pinched, slapped, and even hit routinely in a way that was clearly not meant to be therapeutic. He was left alone outside in the blistering heat and left wet and shivering for hours after a bath. In one particularly gruesome incident, Martin remembers a nurse feeding him his own vomit as punishment for not being able to stop himself from throwing up after being fed scalding hot food. He even remembers experiencing sexual abuse at the hands of those who were meant to be caring for him and protecting him. But perhaps worst of all was the mental abuse. Thinking that Martin was in a vegetative state and unaware, caregivers would routinely hurl abuse at him. They called him names like freak, dummy, donkey, a heap of rubbish, and those were the milder ones. The lowest point though came when his own mother told him she wished he would die. Martin was shocked and hurt. How could his own mother wish death on him? 
Amazingly though, Martin was able to use those feelings as fuel and began to take control of his own mind. If he couldn't escape his physical situation, he was going to do his best to escape mentally and preserve whatever sanity he had left. Martin survived the abuse in isolation by learning to disengage his mind. He said, you simply exist, it's a very dark place to find yourself because, in a sense, you're allowing yourself to vanish. Martin developed coping mechanisms, like tracking the sun's shadow as it moved across the room, watching insects and having conversations with himself in his head. As he strengthened his mind, Martin began to have compassion for his mother and her harsh words. He realized when she looked at him, all she could see was the son she had lost. To her, it was like her son had died when he was 12 years old. Martin could tell she was in pain and often worried that she wasn't a good mother, wasn't taking good enough care of him. The worst part was that Martin could do nothing to ease her fears. Finally, after more than a decade trapped in an immobile body and unable to communicate, Martin experienced the first ray of hope. A new caretaker was compassionate enough to see Martin as a person, not just a body. She actually looked into his eyes and spoke to him, not just at him. And she was the first person in nearly a decade to notice that Martin appeared to show signs of comprehension when she spoke to him. Verna van der Walt would later say that she could tell by the sparkle in his eyes that Martin was conscious and trying to communicate. She managed to convince his parents to take him for extensive cognitive testing, where they got the shock of a lifetime. Martin's mind was perfectly healthy. He was awake and aware, and he remembered everything. This discovery was only the very first step on a long, hard road to recovery, but it was the hope that Martin and his parents had been dreaming of for more than a decade. Martin underwent extreme rehabilitation to begin repairing the damage caused by more than a decade of immobility. After years of inactivity, his muscles had atrophied and he had lost many of his fine motor skills. Martin had to relearn many of the activities of daily living that we take for granted. How to sit up, how to dress and bathe himself, how to feed himself, even how to use his hands. He also had to relearn how to communicate, which he did with the help of a computer. Martin is still confined to a wheelchair and he may never walk again, but he's well on his way to living a full and independent life. In fact, Martin went on to live a shockingly normal life after his ordeal. He graduated university, got a job as a computer programmer, and even married the love of his life. In 2013, Martin wrote a book about his experience called Ghost Boy, the miraculous escape of a misdiagnosed boy trapped inside his own body, which became a New York Times bestseller. Talk about an inspirational story. While Martin's story seems almost too crazy to believe, some doctors are worried that it's an all too common occurrence. Dr. Adrian Owen is the author of Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the boundary between life and death. Dr. Owen believes that 15-20% to of all patients in persistent vegetative states or unresponsive wakefulness are actually conscious and trapped in their own bodies. He spent more than 20 years working with these patients to help better understand the gray zone between consciousness and unconsciousness. In his book, Dr. Owen provides countless examples of patients whose situation is remarkably similar to Martin's. Take Kate, for example, who found herself in a persistent vegetative state after contracting encephalomyelitis, another type of inflammation of the brain and spinal cord tissues. A PET scan showed that Kate's brain responded normally when she was shown pictures of her loved ones. Luckily, Kate recovered from her vegetative state after six months. Another shocking example is the case of Kevin, a 53-year-old bus driver who fell into a coma after suffering a major stroke. FMRI scans showed brain activity consistent with a normal response when Kevin was asked to listen to complex sentences. In another case, a patient named Scott had been comatose for 12 years after a car accident, but his family was adamant that he was still in there. Dr. Owen asked Scott to picture himself playing tennis and the very specific area of our brain associated with playing sports, the premotor cortex, lit up exactly as it would for a healthy person. Scott was even able to answer simple yes or no questions by imagining tennis when the answer was no. Prior to Dr. Owen's work, doctors believed that once someone had been in a persistent vegetative state for a few months, there was zero chance of recovery. This assumption had not only left untold thousands of patients suffering in silence, but it also led to some catastrophic scenarios, like the Venezuelan man named Carlos Camejo who had been unconscious for 10 years following a car accident, only to awaken during his own autopsy. Many people in this situation, like Kate, have even attempted to commit suicide by holding their breath, hoping to exert what little control they had over their own lives. Doctors and researchers are working to better understand the gray zone of consciousness so that hopefully no one will ever have to go through what Martin, Kate, and the thousands of others trapped in their own bodies had to endure. In the meantime, Martin has some advice for us. Treat everyone with kindness, dignity, compassion, and respect irrespective of whether you think they understand or not. Never underestimate the power of the mind, the importance of love and faith, and never stop dreaming.
Imagine doing something boring, like riding the subway or typing away at an expense report, and suddenly your body sends you a very clear message. You need to have sex. Not like a sex fantasy about someone you're attracted to. Rather, you get an intense feeling in your genitals that can only be relieved by sex. You try to ignore it, but it's not going away, and it doesn't care how inappropriate it is for the moment. For a small number of women, this unfortunate situation is reality, and it's one of the rarest and newest sexual disorders out there. Titled Persistent Genital Arousal Disorder, it's not just a one-time thing that makes itself known at an awkward time. This disorder causes sudden and persistent genital arousal without any current sexual stimulation or desire. This unknown disorder was at first mistaken for hypersexuality by puzzled doctors who assumed that this was normal sexual desire gone out of control. But examining a few people who suffered from this condition indicated that it was completely separate from sexual desire. This has led researchers to wonder if the name is appropriate. After all, the women aren't aroused, they are being troubled by a nerve reaction in their genitals that's giving them sensations they don't want. One thing is for sure, the women experiencing this condition all report the symptoms are extreme. When describing the symptoms of the disorder, arousal is the furthest thing from the minds of the sufferers. They feel intense pressure and irritation in their genital area, which can lead to contractions or vaginal congestion. Sometimes spontaneous orgasms can happen, but not in all cases. Sufferers sometimes try to relieve the pressure by masturbating and triggering an orgasm, but this only lasts a short time, if that. Many sufferers report having to have multiple orgasms in a short time to experience any relief, not something that's feasible when it occurs in the middle of a workday. So what causes this bizarre disorder? There are so few cases of persistent genital arousal disorder that no definite cause has been determined yet. Studies indicate that it may be exacerbated by stress, but that's probably not the source of the problem. Originally, doctors assumed it was psychologically based, but attempts to treat the condition through counseling didn't show results. Now it's believed the causes might be neurological or vascular. With conditions like Tarlov cysts or arterial malformations in the pelvic region pressing on a nerve that causes this unusual condition. So what's the solution? The women suffering from the condition are desperate for a cure. Treatments have varied, and so has the success rate. Most early cases were treated with a combination of psychotherapy and pelvic exercises, and while the therapy may or may not have been useful, some women report relief from the exercises. In cases where a physical cause can be determined, some minor surgeries have relieved the condition by removing the pressure, but the disorder isn't fully understood yet, and no one's quite sure why a medicine called varenicline, normally used to treat nicotine addiction, relieved one woman's symptoms. But mainly women suffering from the condition have a bigger problem, getting anyone to take them seriously. When Jeannie Allen came down with the syndrome in her mid-40s, she was one of the first people ever diagnosed and she immediately found out that her condition would make her the subject of mockery. One of the first doctors she talked to even commented that she must be every man's dream, to which she snapped back that he should try to imagine what it would be like to have an orgasm every minute of the day. She was so frustrated that she eventually went public under the pen name Jean Lund and became one of the first people to ever share exactly what it was like to live with this condition long term. She described it as taking the joy out of life and leaving her unable to concentrate on anything else. Another woman, a 40-year-old flower vendor who became the subject of an early clinical study, reported that the episodes happened spontaneously with no trigger and left her exhausted and unable to plan her day effectively. She had previously had an attack of the condition seven years before and found relief after a surgery that removed a ruptured ovary, but now it was back and the doctors were as clueless as she was. They tried the medicine carbamazepine, an anticonvulsant on her, and she stopped after a month due to lack of improvement. However, in her case, supportive therapy sessions seemed to do the trick as they reduced the frequency of symptoms and she was eventually able to resume a normal life. Causes might vary, but one medical condition repeats as likely cause of the condition. What is a Tarlov cyst? The human body is sensitive with a lot of little areas that can go awry and even the smallest problem can have unexpected consequences. The Tarlov cysts are tiny cysts in the spinal canal near the base of the spinal cord and are known for their walls filled with nerve fibers. First discovered by Isidore Tarlov in 1938, he at first assumed them not to cause any adverse symptoms. However, future investigations indicated they can cause pain, spasticity and muscle weakness, headaches and bladder dysfunction among other symptoms. They can wreak havoc on the nervous system and create unpredictable symptoms, including genital dysfunction as they happen to be right by the nerves that affect the genitals. 
When Professor Barry Komisaruk, one of the first researchers investigating persistent genital arousal syndrome, looked at the MRIs of sufferers, he was shocked to discover that two-thirds of them had Tarlov cysts. So there may finally be hope for the women being driven crazy by this strange disorder. Eleven women with the disorder had their Tarlov cysts operated on by Dr. Feigenbaum, a spinal neurosurgeon who had been studying the disorder. They became part of a case study on the disorder, and when they were interviewed after their recovery, eight of the eleven said their symptoms had gone away. The remaining three reported significant relief from before surgery, and this was the best evidence yet that sacral nerve compression was the root cause of the disorder. But not all cases of the disorder have the cysts, and not all people who improve have the surgery. And for Jeannie Allen, these advances weren't much help. She never had a Tarlov cyst, and doctors were at a loss for how to treat her. She eventually quit her job to dedicate herself to advocating for more research and support for women with her condition. Despite the growing awareness, it's still a very rare disorder. While it's believed hundreds of women may suffer from the condition, case studies have only looked at a population of under 30 women. How is the growing awareness of this disorder helping these women? For the first time, women suffering from this strange disorder have a source for help other than doctors who may not fully understand it. They can find fellow sufferers online to learn how they've been coping. This allows them to try various solutions including exercise, meditation, and medication that may or may not be helpful. While many find surgery as a solution, local anesthetic hasn't been successful in preventing the disorder. While the intense feeling is concentrated in one specific area, it doesn't originate there. It's generated in the nervous system, and any solution has to go deeper than skin deep. Persistent genital arousal disorder only affects those with a certain set of equipment, so those with the other set have to be breathing a sigh of relief, right? Not exactly. There's a similar condition that affects men, and it may be even more challenging and uncomfortable. It's called priapism, and it causes similar persistent arousal of the genitals that manifests as a prolonged, uncomfortable erection that persists even in the absence of any stimulation. Most men remember that awkward moment when you really can't stand up because the bulge in your pants has decided to make itself known, but this is an extended erection that can make it difficult to walk, urinate, or concentrate. Like persistent genital arousal disorder, it can be caused by a number of things including sickle cell disease, nerve damage, drug use, or trauma to the penis, another reason to be wary of getting kicked in the genitals. So is there any good news for those suffering from this uncomfortable condition? Well, priapism is more common than persistent genital arousal disorder, and doctors know a lot more about how to treat it. Unfortunately, it also carries more health risks. An erection that lasts too long can cause serious damage as many ads for erectile dysfunction medication have worn. As most cases of priapism are caused by the inability of the penis to drain blood properly, the most common treatment is to numb the area and drain it with a minimally invasive procedure. If blood drainage isn't a problem, treating it can be as easy as a cold compress. But in a worst case scenario, surgery may be performed, and the clock is ticking. Permanent damage can begin after only four hours. It's an embarrassing but not uncommon medical problem. It's estimated that it may occur in as many as 1 in 20,000 men a year. These have got to be some of the strangest sexual disorders to encounter, right? Not quite. Doctors have encountered some genuinely bizarre sexual disorders, some of which they don't have a real answer for yet. One of the most troubling sexual disorders is retrograde ejaculation, which has terrified quite a few couples. In this disorder, everything goes perfectly normally until it's time for the guy to ejaculate. It feels like everything went fine, but nothing's come out. This is a rare disorder caused by a malfunctioning valve between the urethra and the bladder, where the semen doesn't travel down the escape hatch and instead shoots backwards into the bladder. It can make it difficult to conceive, but doesn't really have any serious health risks. The usual culprit? A side effect from medication. There are a few other things better than post-sex bliss, right? Not for the people with the next condition. Post-orgasmic illness syndrome is another condition that's puzzled doctors. For those few men suffering from it, whenever they ejaculate, they immediately come down with a series of flu-like symptoms. That pleasant feeling of an orgasm is immediately replaced by a feverish feeling, a runny nose, and the intense need to lie down. Not exactly a happy ending, and the cause might be even more bizarre. According to Dr. Marcel Waldinger, one of the few doctors to study this condition, the men might be allergic to their own semen. This has led doctors to experiment with a cure by injecting these men with a diluted solution made from their own sperm. Most of these conditions only manifest during or after sex, but this next one might be painfully obvious much earlier. 
Phimosis is a malformation of the foreskin surrounding the penis that makes it too tight, essentially forming a band around the tip that can make sex or any other pressure on the penis extremely painful. The disorder exists from birth but only becomes obvious when someone tries to have sex or masturbate. The good news is this disorder isn't nearly as mysterious as others. It's a simple skin problem and can be corrected by a circumcision procedure that's slightly more extensive than average, removing all the foreskin instead of only a part. The biggest challenge for the sufferers? Going to the doctor and admitting this embarrassing problem. The next disorder might sound less terrifying than the others, but it can make for some awkward conversations. Due to a problem during the development of a fetus, it's possible for male children to be born with two penises called diphalia. This is a rare condition that's most surprising for the fact that in some cases both penises function for both urination and ejaculation. One is usually smaller than the other, but that's the only distinction. The disorder can also manifest as a part of larger developmental abnormalities that require surgical intervention, and each case is handled independently as doctors figure out an approach that will lead to the most normal life for the affected child. It's rare for adults with diphalia who have not had the condition treated to be found, so unpleasant surprises in the bedroom are unlikely. With many sexual disorders like persistent genital arousal disorder, doctors are often unsure of whether the cause is physical, psychological, or due to side effects from an exterior stimulus. That's why those suffering from these rare disorders often find that their fellow sufferers are the best source of information as everyone tries to puzzle out these weird quirks of human sexuality. We've talked about what happens when you die, an episode that was very popular. Now we tackle a similar question, what happens just before you die? This question comes to us from Jody. As you may already know, we love answering questions from you, our beloved viewers. So today, as per Jody's request, we dare to venture deep into the subject in our quest to find out if your life really does flash before your eyes in your final moment. To begin with, we'll start with what happens to you physically, depending on how you die. Let's first talk about drowning. This is a very uncomfortable death, characterized by an inability to breathe that leads to your demise underwater. What happens is that you struggle with your mouth below the surface, you panic and might begin to aspirate and inhale water. This leads you to having a laryngospasm which happens when your vocal cords close and block airways in an attempt to protect your lungs. When this happens, you're unable to scream for help. Thus, drowning is mostly a silent death. When not enough oxygen reaches the body's tissues, you then go through something known as hypoxia. You become unconscious and your airway relaxes, which allows your lungs to fill up with water. Prolonged time without air can lead to cardiac arrest and brain damage before finally leading to death. This is not a good way to go, so it's highly recommended that you wear a life vest if you don't know how to swim. Either that or keep an inflatable pool toy under you. The unicorn floaty is all the rage right now, get one with a cup holder while you're at it, so you can keep a martini on hand. Death by hypothermia, where the core body temperature drops to a dangerous level, causes you to shiver intensely. After extended exposure to freezing temperatures, your body functions start to slow down, including your respiration, heart, and metabolic rates. You then lose consciousness before you die. An example of this type of death would include what happened to Jack in the movie Titanic. Spoiler alert, we saw him turn into a human popsicle before he sunk dramatically into the dark depths of the Atlantic. Rose let go of him in the moment after saying she wouldn't. What's up with that? We feel that we need to add that Jack could have easily fit onto the door that was used as a raft. He just didn't try hard enough. At any rate, you definitely wouldn't want to perish in icy cold waters this way. It's not a fun way to go, especially if you hate the cold. On the opposite end of the spectrum, death by burning has to be a very horrifying way to meet your demise. Sometimes when people were burned at the stake back in the dark ages, they would die from carbon monoxide poisoning before the flames completely consumed them. This happens when you breathe in too much carbon. It's definitely not a pleasant way to go. In fact, it's excruciatingly painful. Yet carbon monoxide poisoning would have been considered a merciful death in comparison to feeling a fire melt away your flesh. The human body can burn for several hours, but if you're lucky, you're already already dead by the time the dermis cracks. The dermis, in case you didn't know, is the thick layer of skin under the epidermis, which is the thin layer of outer skin. Sometimes burns can cause so much damage to your nerves that you're no longer able to detect pain. More than likely, however, you've already died before you can recognize that you don't feel pain anymore. The initial agony of being burned alive can also be so intense that some people may die of primary shock when blood pressure drops so low that vital organs can no longer function. Suffocation from the fumes and heat stroke can also result in death before the actual flames do the job. With heat stroke, your brain and other vital organs swell, which can be fatal if left untreated. 
Now that we've covered some of the extreme, horrific, morbid aspects of physical causes of death and what happens to the body before dying, let's explore what might happen mentally before you die. We mean aside from the obvious panic you might experience if you're aware of what's happening to you. This is a big topic because there are a lot of strange and abnormal things people claim to have happened in the moments just before death. Neurologist Dr. Cameron Shaw believes he knows exactly what happens to us 30 seconds before we meet the Grim Reaper. He's dissected a woman's brain in order to find out what was going on immediately before she died. What he found was chilling. First, he says, we lose our sense of self. This reportedly is because the brain tends to die from the top down, and blood supply is gathered from underneath. Thus, the prefrontal cortex, the part responsible for cognition, planning, personality, decision making, and moderating social behavior, loses blood first as the brain drains. This implies that our sense of self, sense of humor, and our ability to think ahead all dissipates within the first 10 to 20 seconds out of the 30 second countdown to death. Then Dr. Shaw explains, as the wave of blood starved brain cells spread out, our memories and language centers short out and we're left with just a core. By this point, you have no awareness of what's happening. Not to be overly grim, but you basically shut down, go blank, fall into the dark pit of nothingness, whatever you prefer to call it. Dr. Shaw says that you do see a white light at the end of a tunnel before you die, but not necessarily because you're drifting into heaven. We hate to break it to you, but Dr. Shaw says this happens when the sudden loss of blood supply to the brain causes tunnel vision. The first thing that's noticed is a feeling of being faint, as well as the narrowing of your vision, which is followed by an ominous or peaceful darkness depending on how you perceive it. But it all has to do with the loss of blood to your head. Dr. Shaw also explains the concept of the out-of-body experience, which many people have claimed to have been through during life-threatening near-death experiences. This is said to happen when people perceive themselves to be floating through the air like a spirit, ghost, or apparition. They see objects in another room or the tops of people's heads from an aerial view. Dr. Shaw that this is just a trick of the mind and that it's not real. He claims that the out-of-body experience is little more than a myth. He says, quote, the brain can create a visual world around you that resembles something close to reality that isn't reality because you're actually blind. What we think he means by this is that you're blind to your surroundings while in this state of mind because you're basically unconscious. Some people who have experienced the out-of-body sensation, however, will continue to assert that this was very real to them. Many will jump to its defense. Now, what about the question regarding whether your life flashes before your eyes? You may be interested to know that yes, indeed it does, but not in the way you think. What we mean to say is that you won't visualize yourself as a baby and watch yourself grow up. It doesn't happen chronologically like like in the movies. You'll simply witness key memories randomly based on importance and which events sparked the greatest emotion for you. In the final moments, you'll think about the most notable or prominent moments of your life. The most memorable aspects of your existence pop into your thoughts. Your first kiss, graduation, holidays with your family, the day you got married to your spouse, the day your first child was born, and more. Some people who have experienced this near-death occurrence say that many memories were packed into a short period of time. Some have even gone so far as to say that it felt like centuries had passed while they were witnessing the memories of their lives play out before them like a movie across a screen. One person claimed being able to actually feel what friends and family members felt through each memory. The same person was quoted in an article in The Sun saying, I was allowed to see part of them and feel for myself what they felt. In essence, empathy for others was said to be directly experienced during this ordeal. Perhaps this was to teach a life lesson about consideration for others. Philosophically, we can only speculate. Now, Dr. Cameron Shaw is not the first or last professional to study what happens before you die. And if you watched our video called Did Scientists Really Find a Way to Bring the Dead Back to Life? Then you may have learned that a study on pig brains revealed that the organ can continue to function cellularly after pronounced clinically dead. This means that it's theoretically possible to be partially dead or partially alive. Creepy. In all likelihood, however, you're not conscious enough to realize that you are somewhat dead. For those who have ever been around someone with a terminal illness in their final moments of life, often it's said that a loss of consciousness is the first physical change to occur. Still, even while unconscious, the person might still be able to hear or feel you. After consciousness goes, there may be changes to the skin, where it becomes slightly blue in color. Breathing may become loud as mucus builds up in the throat. As the end draws nearer, shallow breathing may stop and start again between breaths. This is known as chain stokes breathing. 
It can last for a short or long time before finally stopping entirely. During the bodily transition to death, it's likely that you're not distressed or in pain because you're not aware that you're dying. For this reason, many believe that the changeover is relatively peaceful because, as the common saying goes, ignorance is bliss. Some people choose when and where to die and are able to hang on a little longer until a loved one arrives at their bedside. Others may not be so lucky and may be unable to control when they go. Many people often feel guilty for not being there at the precise moment when their loved one passed. They might feel like they let the person down by missing the crucial moment. It might be of comfort to know that the person was probably not aware of your absence when they passed. Still, if friends or family members are distressed by the passing of their loved one, they're usually referred to consult with a bereavement counselor who's trained in helping people who are undergoing these exact situations. Counselors can be very helpful and beneficial with assisting people through the difficult grieving process. Receiving bereavement support is important, and we'd strongly recommend doing so if you've just lost someone close to you. So you say you don't sleep well and you don't know why because you feel good and you do all the right things in your life to get a decent night's sleep. What you don't know is that you actually don't do the things that are conducive to getting a solid 8 hours with those needed spurts of rapid eye movement. There are things you do that you're not even aware of that affect you getting the requisite hours in a deep sleep mode. And today we're going to tell you what you're doing wrong. So first of all, you're not alone. Did you know that in the USA it's reported that a whopping 60% of people have trouble sleeping most nights or even every night? That's according to the National Sleep Foundation. And when it comes to sleeping, this organization knows what it's talking about. The same study tells us that 43% of those people rarely or never get a good night's sleep. Well, at least people aged 13 to 64. A lot of those folks say they don't even get 6 hours of sleep a night. And the word on the street is, we should get 7 to 9 hours if we want to feel good. The sleep deprivation era is here, and there is one big reason why we seem to be sleeping less. The reason is technology. With the National Sleep Foundation reporting that 95% of people use an electronic gadget of some kind right before bed. Hmm, are you watching this show just before you intend to sleep? But we're not just talking about phones. TVs are included in the list of gadgets. This is what one expert said about gadget use before bed. Artificial light exposure between dusk and the time we go to bed at night suppresses release of the sleep-promoting hormone melatonin, enhances alertness, and shifts circadian rhythms to a later hour, making it more difficult to fall asleep. We're not saying don't use gadgets, but perhaps if you want to get your 8 hours and drift off quickly, you might think about not looking at a screen for the 2 hours before you intend to sleep. Around 60% of people in one study said they use their laptop or phone right before they go to bed, and some of them play computer games, which is really not conducive to making yourself tired. Another sleep expert said this about that. Over the last 50 years, we've seen how television viewing has grown to be near constant before bed. And now we're seeing new information technologies such as laptops, cell phones, video games, and music devices rapidly gaining the same status. You might think it doesn't affect you at all, but according to these experts, it does and there's data to back that up. We should add that the artificial light theory about keeping us awake is controversial, and so more research needs to be done. According to studies, a lot of Americans leave their phone alerts on during the night, and 1 in 10 people interviewed said their phone woke them up during the night at times. Just turn off the alerts, it's simple to do. The problem these days is that many people have online friends all over the world, so when you're trying to sleep in the UK, your friends in the USA are sending you photos of kittens on Facebook Messenger. You might have a client in Asia who keeps posting stuff about the work you do when you're trying to sleep in Canada. You may wake up and not know why, but often it's because something went down in that phone of yours. Another study said younger folks were terrible at this, saying that 72% of American kids aged 6 to 17 go to bed with their phone. In the past, kids may have slept with a furry bear or a book, and those things don't make any noise. So why do people these days feel they need to sleep with their phone? What's so important that it can't wait? Are you really that addicted to the thing? The co-founder of Huffington Post, Ariana Huffington, has said in interviews that this tech addiction is a major issue and is affecting the mental health of people. She said the parents are often as bad as the kids, so they need to start setting a better example. She talks about the dopamine hits we get from technology, and so scrolling through Facebook right before bed is not a good idea. When she sleeps, there's no technology in her room at all. You might also get stressed by looking at social media before bedtime. You really don't want to get a shot of envy right before you try to fall asleep. 
Oh look, there's my friend on a beach in some country I can't afford to go to. That's not what you want in your head before you try to fall asleep. So technology, this is what's keeping you awake. Our advice is simple. Do not look at any electronic screens at least two hours before bedtime. You might not believe it, but it's negatively affecting your sleep cycle. If you're a parent, don't allow tech in your kids' bedrooms. If you're a kid, wise up and turn that stuff off. Show some self-control. And if we're starting to sound like we're giving you a lecture, we should say that we only just started doing this ourselves. We can tell you that we started to sleep better. Now let's say you don't use an electronic gadget, but still can't sleep. You're not depressed or particularly stressed and so you don't know what the problem is. You haven't just fallen in love or lost a job. You're fine, but sleeping is hard work for you. You know, it could be those coffees that you're having in the evening. Or perhaps those cups of tea? We know those British folks love their tea and quite a few of them will have a cuppa in the evening, perhaps with their suppa. We know this because we've seen it firsthand. That cup of the finest Tetley's tea could actually be keeping those Brits awake. That cappuccino from Starbucks the American had at 7 p.m. could ruin that person's sleep. This is the lowdown on the drug, caffeine. Once you've had your hit, you'll peak around 30 to 60 minutes later. That buzz will then plateau, but caffeine has a half-life of 5 to 6 hours, meaning this is the time it takes for your body to get rid of half of the drug. Still, you have some caffeine in your system for hours after that. Now, as you know, it's not as if caffeine can be compared to a substance such as ice, the illegal kind. But it is a stimulant, and we should say that Americans love the stuff, perhaps just as much as those Brits love their tea. One study we found said this, the average daily consumption of caffeine by adults in the US is about 300 mg per person. This is about three times higher than the world average, but it's still only half of the caffeine consumption in heavy tea drinking countries such as England and Sweden. Some people like coffee too much, and while there are many positive effects to having that shot of espresso, you can go overboard. In extreme cases, believe it or not, people have died from overdosing on caffeine. In less extreme cases, people just feel weird. That might not be so bad in the morning, but at nighttime it can be a nightmare. You can look at coffee charts from Starbucks or other outlets and see how much caffeine there is in one cup. It depends on the size of the cup, but your instant stuff might just have 50 milligrams of caffeine in it, which isn't going to make you fire up some techno music and start dancing. But many outlets sell cups of coffee with 200 or even 400 milligrams of caffeine in the cup. The Starbucks Blonde Roast has a massive 475 milligrams of caffeine in it. Some experts say when you get a hit of 500 to 600 milligrams, it's like a small dose of amphetamine. Tea drinkers will fare better as a regular cup might only contain 50 milligrams of caffeine. But given some folks drink tea as if they were addicted to it, it's possible to get a tea high. The long and short of this all is that you really shouldn't be consuming caffeine in the evening at all. We suggest you have your last hit in the afternoon. We found one study that told us having caffeine six hours before bedtime reduced people's sleep time by one hour. Energy drinks also contain caffeine, and so those 10 vodka Red Bulls you had at the party might not only just make you act like an idiot, but it will likely cut down on your sleep time. A can of Coke will have caffeine in it if it's not the non-caffeine variety, so remember that some soft drinks before bed might not be a good thing. The US Food and Drug Administration tells us that caffeine is for the most part a safe substance, but it says you should probably not consume more than 400 mg a day. That's easy to do when you're chugging tea and coffee all day and then having your Cokes for lunch and dinner. What about eating late at night? Some studies tell us that late eaters might gain weight because you're hardly active when you're sleeping. Another study conducted in the University of Pennsylvania in 2017 said eating late at night gives people a higher chance of getting type 2 diabetes. The study said late eating can raise cholesterol levels and so give you a better chance of having a heart attack. In fact, there isn't much happy information concerning eating late, but lots of people do it. Imagine this, some kid munching on a bag of Doritos while drinking a Coke and scrolling through envy-inducing Facebook right before that kid wants to sleep. That makes about as much sense as someone going to a nightclub to meditate or heading to the shooting range to study for their calculus exam. It makes no sense at all, but people do it. We imagine a few of you are doing something like that right now, but you can admit to it later. At nighttime, give your digestive system a break. There's evidence that it's not only bad for your health, but food in your full stomach can affect how much quality sleep you get. If you watched our other sleep show, you'll know that the good kind of sleep is when you go into deep sleep and these are called rapid eye movement cycles. You should be getting about five of these a night. The other sleep is called non-rapid eye movement. Studies have shown that food before bed can reduce these deep sleep cycles and prevent you from having the dreams that are so important to your mental well-being. 
Sugar, carbs, and fats are the worst things to eat late at night, so perhaps we'll forgive you for having one small bite of banana. This is the conclusion of one article we found. Eating during bedtime hours, whether it's a large dinner or a small snack, while watching your favorite TV show, while it may seem to help you fall asleep, may actually harm your overall health and metabolism, creating added stress inside the body. So there you go. If you're healthy and not suffering from some physical or mental disease, this might be the reason you're not sleeping well. It's really simple advice to follow. Just turn off your gadgets two hours before bed, don't consume caffeine at least six hours before bed, and don't eat before you sleep. If indeed you're watching the show at midnight with your mouth full of chocolate being cement mixed with Coca-Cola, you're basically creating a perfect storm of bad sleep. Or do you disagree? We all know what it's like to be hungry, maybe even really, really hungry. Your stomach growls, you might get a little lightheaded, your body's doing everything it can to tell you that it's time to drop whatever you're doing and grab a snack. It's a minor inconvenience that we all must live with, unless you're a robot or a human with cybernetic stomach that runs on cold fusion. But that's a subject for another episode. If you're too lazy to cook, maybe you pop a frozen dinner in the microwave or resort to a cup of ramen noodles. Whatever your case may be, your munching quickly satisfies your demanding stomach and you can move on with your day. But what if you had to endure that sensation of hunger for a longer period of time? What's it like to experience starvation? And how long can you go without eating? Now, just to be clear, we wouldn't recommend that you go home after watching this episode and attempt to stop eating. That would not be a very good idea. If you do decide that you want to challenge yourself, please consult your doctor before doing so. After all, we wouldn't want to see one of our beloved fans starve. Not that we're insulting your intelligence, we just felt the need to add a disclosure here. You know, just so we don't get into trouble for being a bad influence on young minds. Anywho, as you may already know, the human body can't last more than a few days without water. So just to add a bit of clarification, the cases we'll explore don't involve going without much needed H2O. We're talking solely about food. Because it's unethical to study starvation in a laboratory for obvious reasons, there's a current lack of scientific research about it. Thus, most studies revolving around the subject tend to examine occurrences of starvation in the real world, including instances of religious fasts and hunger strikes. Since these individuals are already choosing not to eat by choice, Choice, scientists can ethically look into and monitor the effects of these particular cases. We can also look into it by examining past instances of starvation. You're probably familiar with the historically famous Mahatma Gandhi, the man who lived in India during the late 1800s and early 1900s, inspired movements for civil rights and freedom across the world. He was a greatly inspirational figure, and some of his quotes live on today. Sayings like, the weak can never forgive, forgiveness is the attribute of the strong, where there is love, there is life, and many more. You may also know that he survived 21 days of complete starvation. How did he do it? What was his secret? That's what we endeavored to find out. Gandhi took on a total of about 17 fasts during India's freedom movement for independence from British rule. He often used hunger strikes as a tool to promote his philosophy of non-violence. It was his way of performing a peaceful protest. His first fast took place in 1913 from November 10th to the 16th. In 1914, his next fast expanded to 14 days. His third successful fast lasted three days in 1918 and resulted in Amitabad mill owners rushing to the negotiation table to seal a settlement with the striking workers that Gandhi had led. He continued to take on fasts of different lengths in 1919, 1921, and 1922. Thus, in 1924, by the time of his famous 21-day long fast, he'd already had a lot of practice with self-control and restraint from eating. He, of course, endured many more fasts after this, but 21 days was the longest his fast ever lasted. The Mahatma is considered the champion in the Department of Fasting and Hunger Striking. Many people have made attempts to follow the master and try it for themselves. They say it takes a ton of willpower and the temptation to eat can be highly, highly overwhelming. Starvation itself is not pleasant. You know that awful feeling you experience when you haven't eaten all day? Imagine that feeling, but way more intense. The severe deficiency in calorie intake combined with the most extreme conditions of malnutrition imaginable are enough to drive you mad. In this state of mind, it can be more than a little challenging to resist food. An almost animalistic mindset consumes you. You become ravenous, losing all sense of your humanity as your survival instincts take over. Suddenly, eating is no longer a choice, it's a must. People who have undergone starvation in extreme circumstances have reverted to just about anything to relieve their hunger. Consider the story of the 1972 plane crash in the Andes Mountains. A team of rugby players trapped in snow and freezing cold temperatures experienced extreme starvation to the point where they were forced to turn to 
cannibalism. The cold caused them to burn calories more quickly, and they were desperate. Thus, they ate the dead bodies of human casualties from the crash. We made an episode about this disaster not too long ago, so as a side note, you should check it out. There's another story from an episode of I Shouldn't Be Alive where two young teenage boys named Josh and Troy found themselves stranded in the Atlantic Ocean after taking a fishing boat out from the coast of South Carolina. They were lost at sea for six days, suffering from extreme starvation. This hunger caused one of the boys to snack on the poisonous jellyfish and even considered eating his own finger. The awful feeling of deprivation was enough to make both boys wish for death. One even attempted to drown himself to ease his suffering, but to no avail. This may seem like nothing though compared to the 76-day man, but that's discussed in another episode. There's a reason the temptation to eat is so powerful. After all, prolonged starvation can cause organ damage and death. In patients with anorexia nervosa, up to 20% die from organ failure or myocardial cardial infarction. This tends to happen when the body weight falls between 60 to 80 pounds. Thus, the instinctual mechanism of action urging us to eat is meant and designed by nature to keep us alive. When you fast for a long time, you're basically fighting against your biological drive. Experts tend to recommend that you eat every 3 to 4 hours or so for optimal health, but starvation doesn't happen immediately, so skipping a meal now and then isn't a big deal. Your body is a well-oiled machine that doesn't want to go into starvation mode and will usually do whatever it takes to preserve energy to resist going into that physical state. Many people claim that they feel like they go into starvation mode after about a day of not eating, but this isn't the case. It doesn't happen as quickly as you might think. Registered dietitian Dr. Dubost from Pennsylvania told Self.com that it's actually very difficult to go into complete clinical starvation mode. There is also a difference between the popular culture perception of starvation mode and actually being physically starving. The threshold of time to enter the realm of starvation depends on the individual, but overall she says that it certainly takes longer than going a day without food. Once you're in that zone where you're really starving, there are said to be three phases that you go through before you die. Morbid, we know. Each phase is more unpleasant than the last. In the first phase, blood glucose levels are maintained through production of glucose from proteins, glycogens, and fat. There's only enough glycogen stored in a person's liver to last a few hours. After this, blood glucose levels are maintained from breaking down fats and proteins. The longer you go without eating, the more your body turns to resources within itself to keep going. The second phase of starvation lasts the longest of the three. During this time, your body fat is the main energy source. Your body drains itself of your fat to keep it sustained. You increasingly feel yourself getting skinnier, but not necessarily in a good or healthy way. It may be here where you feel like your body is screaming at you. I know you want to look good in that bikini, it might say, but please eat something, anything, help us out here. Resisting its message is not easy, especially if you have access to food. The third phase of starvation occurs when fat reserves are used up and depleted. The body then starts taking from your muscles to feed itself. When muscles are depleted, cell functions start to degenerate. Along with your weight loss, you may experience symptoms of apathy, withdrawal, listlessness, and increased susceptibility to disease. The last one happens because the impact of starvation weakens your immune system. Some people end up dying of illness due to starvation before actually dying from starvation itself. The diseases that starving people succumb to mainly include kwashiorkor and marasmus. Kwashiorkor affects those who are protein energy deficient and results in edema and enlarged fatty liver. This is also what gives starving children bellies, creating an illusion that they are well fed. Marasmas also happen due to extreme energy deficiency and results in infections that are caused by dangerously low levels of body weight. Death by starvation is incredibly slow and painful. When death finally does come, it's usually caused by cardiac arrhythmia. How long it takes to die often depends on your original BMI or body mass index before starvation. Generally, however, people typically die of starvation in about three weeks. Gandhi pushed the limits when he made it to 21 days, though some people have actually managed to surpass the master. As cited in Scientific American, reports from well-documented studies have shown survivors of hunger strikes after 28, 36, 38, and even 40 days. But wait, some reports go beyond this. In 1981, a hunger strike performed by political prisoners against British presence in Northeast Ireland resulted in 10 people dying between periods of 46 and 73 days without food. Now, that's a stretch. Of course, this did lead to their demise so they wouldn't have been able to exercise their bragging rights upon the strike's conclusion. One strategy that has been used to stave off hunger by those who have fasted for long periods of time include keeping notes to remind themselves of their motivation behind doing so. They ask themselves questions like, why am I still doing this, and what's the point of this again? They then try and answer the question so that the reasoning is fresh in their minds, pushing forward their motivation to continue not eating. Of course, this technique is not always perfect unless you have a very strong self-control like Gandhi. For most of us, we might cave in and decide that fasting isn't worth the effort anymore once we get
get a whiff of a juicy, delicious steak, or a McDonald's hamburger with fries. Getting hungry? Yeah, we don't blame you. All this talk of hunger and not eating kinda makes you want to eat, doesn't it? In order to abstain from food for as long as great hunger strikers and avoid temptation, your reasoning behind a fast has to be a good one. In other words, you must be highly motivated to fast or you'll just wind up quitting easily and quickly. Some fast out of political motivation like Gandhi, while others may do it for religious purposes. Fasting for a greater cause seems to lead to the most successes. But if you're fasting for the sake of it, you may find that you soon give up, perhaps even before entering true starvation. This is because the pain of long-term hunger is too intense to endure without very strong, solid, motivational reasoning. Germs. They're everywhere, and they're always trying to kill you. Right now, as you sit at your computer or watching on your phone, all matter of deadly germs are crawling all over you. Your hands, your chest, your face, in your mouth. There's nowhere they can't reach. Right this second, you have a 25% chance of carrying deadly Staphylococcus bacteria, of staph infection infamy. Luckily for you though, much like your own farts, your staph bacteria are generally harmless to you. But staph bacteria from another person can give you a deadly infection. And if you're wondering where it lives, well, that answer is pretty much everywhere. To include your skin, eye, nose, and mouth. Generally though, it's bacteria that doesn't normally live on the human body that's deadly. And throughout history, mankind has been decimated by all forms of plagues. But what were the deadliest plagues in history? Native American Smallpox Back in the 15th century, Europeans who weren't Vikings discovered the New World, and shortly after the discovery they made friends with the local natives, and nothing bad ever happened after that. Just kidding. Europeans very quickly got to work on their favorite historical pastime, subjugating and brutalizing native populations. This time though they had some extra help in the form of all manner of bacteria and viruses that Native Americans had never encountered before. Back when healthcare consisted of draining bad blood out and then dying of the resulting infection, smallpox killed about one in three Europeans who got infected. Native Americans, however, had little to no resistance to the disease, and thus when they made contact with Europeans, the disease very quickly decimated Native American society. It's believed that between 1500 and 1900, European diseases killed up to half of all Native Americans, and most of that was purely by accident. It wasn't until the 1800s that the US cavalry got the idea of handing out smallpox infected blankets to Native Americans who were stubbornly settling on the land the US had rightfully claimed thousands of years ago when man first arrived to North America but forgot to tell everyone about it. Cholera Pandemic Cholera is one of those diseases that just never goes out of style. It's a die-hard classic, a real crowd pleaser, and to date there's been seven told cholera pandemics throughout human history. The deadliest, however, is considered to be the third, which struck between 1852 and 1860. For thousands of years, mankind paid little attention to the quality of its drinking water, and for nearly all of human history, literally nobody saw a problem with having your sewage run right next to or into your drinking water supply. This worked out great for all matter of diseases, who took advantage of the terrible sanitation to wreak havoc on mankind. Cholera is one such disease, and during its third outbreak it's believed that it started its world comeback tour in India. With the Ganges River being one of the most important in the world as far as human settlements are concerned, it has long been one of the most polluted. In 2011, a report on the water quality of the river revealed that the water contained 1.1 billion fecal bacteria per 100 milliliters. That's about half a million times the recommended bathing limit. Add to that the practice of cremating corpses directly on the banks of the river and India's huge population, of which a large amount believe it's a sacred experience to bathe in the poop-filled river, and it's little surprise that cholera has frequently struck the region. During the third outbreak though, cholera first struck in India, then spread to Afghanistan and slowly across to Russia, where it killed an estimated 1 million people. From Russia it made its way to Europe and to Africa, finally landing on the shores of America. Antonine Plague Back in 165 AD, Rome had about 200 good years left in her, and the plague that struck her from 165 to 180 AD is believed to have hastened her downfall. Today, nobody knows exactly what disease struck the Romans, as back then doctors were just as likely to feed you mercury to cure your cough or give you mercury for your back pain. 
Seriously, those guys loved mercury, and it's little surprise so many prominent Romans were crazier than a barrel of angry monkeys. With an estimated death toll of 5 million, whatever plague struck the Romans, it was clearly devastating, and symptoms included fever, diarrhea, and inflammation of the throat. In some cities, up to one-third of the population succumbed to the plague, and today historians believe that the culprit was either measles or smallpox. Luckily today, we don't have to worry about either of those two devastating diseases thanks to vaccines. Except yes, we do because anti-vaxxers have refused to vaccinate their children, leading to modern outbreaks of diseases mankind had all but eradicated. Third Bubonic Plague If cholera is a classic, the bubonic plague is a downright golden oldie. If you've seen our previous episode on the Black Death, you'll know that this disease is caused by a nasty little bacteria who likes to take over your lymph nodes and then literally makes your body kill you. In 1850, Chinese prospectors and entrepreneurs flooded the western Yunnan region in search of minerals and ores. Soon the population had exploded to over 7 million, and this created the perfect conditions necessary for the plague to revisit humanity. Plague-infected fleas were soon biting all manner of people, acting as the primary vector between the yellow-breasted rat and humans. When Han Chinese and Hui Muslim miners got into armed conflict over the mineral wealth of the area, the plague exploded onto the scene. Thanks to the displacement of huge populations due to armed conflict, the plague made its way east toward China's shores. There, it would kill 100,000 people in Hong Kong and 60,000 in Canton. Aboard trade ships, the disease made its way to India, where it would go on to kill 10 million. Over the next 30 years, it would kill another 12.5 million. On a bright note, the restrictive actions of the British government in trying to contain the plague would foster much of the discontent that would later lead to an Indian independence movement. Plague of Justinian 400 years after the Antonine Plague, rats in a grain shipment from Egypt brought the deadly bubonic plague back to Europe. In 541 AD, half of the population of Constantinople, then the capital of the Western Roman Empire, died to the plague, and from there the disease spread across Europe. Incredibly, historians believe that the bubonic plague actually prevented the rise of a new Roman Empire, as it weakened the Western Roman Empire so severely that it was unable to triumph over the Goths and reunite the Eastern Roman Empire with the West into a new Roman Empire. After killing between 25 and 100 million across Europe and Asia, the plague once more faded, though it would return sporadically until the last outbreak in 750 AD. As if killing hundreds of millions of people throughout history wasn't bad enough, we also have the bubonic plague to blame for the failure of Constantinople to reunite the Roman Empire, and there's no telling what the world of today might look like if a unified Rome had averted the Dark Ages. HIV AIDS Ask anybody who grew up in the 80s what the most feared acronym they ever heard was and they'd tell you without hesitation, it's AIDS, a disease originating in Africa. It first struck the civilized world in a major fashion in America, where it was initially identified in homosexuals. This unfortunately led to the stereotype that HIV or AIDS was only a gay disease and thus a lack of safe sex techniques between heterosexuals quickly led to the disease infecting millions around the world. Today, 600 people a day contract HIV, and in some parts of Africa, as much as 15% of the population is infected. As of 2017, 39 million people already have died of HIV, out of 76.3 million who have been infected. Thanks to safe sex practices and education, infection rates have finally slowed and the world seems to be on the other side of the peak of the HIV pandemic, though not by far. New treatments offer ways to cope with the disease and even prevent its outbreak from HIV into AIDS, but these treatments are expensive and the populations that need them the most, poor third world individuals, simply can't afford them. A failure to treat these vulnerable populations inevitably leads to infections across the rest of the world thanks to our modern interconnected world. Standing for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS is a condition caused by the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. AIDS can take years to manifest, but when it does, it's characterized by HIV's aggressive attacks against the immune system, destroying white blood cells and T cells which help fight off infections. Your immune system is constantly working to keep you healthy, and our environment is swarming with all manner of harmful bacteria, viruses, and fungi which are looking to turn you into a snack. Without your immune system working properly, AIDS leads to death from all matter of secondary infections and, unless treated early, is almost certainly fatal. Spanish Flu At the end of World War I, Europe was in a sorry state. The war had ravaged the countryside and displaced millions of people. Food supplies were low and clean drinking water was rare. 
Add to that huge numbers of dead and the concentration of wounded still being treated in makeshift hospitals, and you had conditions ripe for a pandemic. Despite having nothing to do with Spain or the Spanish, the Spanish flu struck soon after the end of the war and appeared almost simultaneously in Boston, USA, Brest, France, and Freetown, Sierra Leone. Thanks to air and ocean travel, the flu virus spread around the world. Yet the flu virus was not a particularly different strain of the same flu you might catch today. All flu viruses mutate over time, but despite what people initially thought, this was not some superbug. The poor sanitary conditions, the concentration of wounded troops in massive field hospitals, and poor nutrition for wartime populations had instead created a world just ripe for the flu to become truly deadly. The most at risk were the young and elderly, but with so many combat wounded and malnourished civilians, the flu is thought to have killed between 50 and 100 million. The Black Death To date, there has been no epidemic more deadly than the Black Death or the bubonic plague. Though it should be noted that the disease had struck many times before it went to Blockbuster in 1347. Arriving from the plains of Central Asia where climate change was forcing infected rodents into human population centers, the plague quickly spread from Asia westward toward Europe, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake. Across the Islamic world, the Black Death killed millions after arriving in Egypt from Constantinople. All told, the outbreak killed between 75 to 200 million people, and it took humanity two whole centuries to recover the lost numbers. The disease inflamed major tensions across various social groups, and shortly after the plague receded in 1353, major violence against minorities in Europe exploded, as everybody from gypsies to Jews were blamed for the seemingly supernatural plague. On the bright side, though, the plague killed so many people that it created a massive labor shortage, and this left nobles without enough peasants to work their lands. With the bargaining chips firmly on their side, the peasantry was able to use the value of their labor to demand better wages and living conditions, laying the foundations for many of the major labor movements that would redefine European and world history in later centuries. Without the Black Plague and its deadly impact on humanity, modern labor movements that brought us the two-day weekend, sick days, paid vacation, and other perks we enjoy and expect from jobs today may never have existed. I was in agony. Absolute, total agony. Around me were hundreds if not thousands of people, all of us intent on being some of the first people to take a ride on Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure at Universal's Islands of Adventure theme park. I had seen the sneak preview video and it looked amazing, like no other ride I'd ever seen. There was no way I was going to drop out of that queue, but the pain, oh my god the pain. I felt as if I was holding on to a rising balloon, and if I just held on a little longer, I could make it, but if my grip failed me, I would fall and die. Well, that's just a metaphor, but in reality, I really was on the verge of death. Let me explain. First of all, you should know that I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, not just a fan of the movies, but the books and everything else related to the magical teen and his band of extraordinary buddies. You're probably thinking that I'm just a kid, but you'd be wrong. I was a kid when the first movies came out, but as some guys on the mean streets sometimes say, once an addict, always an addict. When I heard about the new ride in Orlando, I got in touch with another guy I knew from the Harry Potter fan club Facebook page, and we both agreed we'd try to get in on the inaugural ride. The reason I picked him is because we both live in Florida. I'm in Tampa, and he's in Jacksonville. We wouldn't have to travel too far, so the deal was made. The plan was to get a hotel close to the theme park and the next day wake up well before dawn and start queuing before the crowds came. As you guys all know, you can have the best intentions in the evening and when you get up in the morning, you don't have the same amount of enthusiasm. We were sharing a room and that meant when that alarm clock went off at 3 a.m., we weren't in the best of moods. Maybe those few beers the evening before had been a bad idea. Fortunately, the hotel had a 24-hour cafe, so I sank two double espressos followed by a bottle of water, followed by a mocha frappuccino to go. My friend wasn't into coffee. He said it gave him anxiety, but I can tell you this, soon after I downed those espressos, I was good to go. Since I knew we'd be standing in line for maybe a couple of hours, we bought some stuff from the convenience store and put the food, water, and soft drinks in our backpacks. What was surprising was the fact that when we got to the park around 5 a.m., there was already a stream of people lined up at the entrance to the park, all of them there for Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure. No kidding, we even met a guy who'd come all the way from England. The dude was dressed in a wizard's cape and written on it were the words potty for potter. He had to explain to me that potty can mean crazy in the UK. The guy was kinda condescending about having to explain that to me, but I paid it no mind. 
The guy was potty. There was no doubt about that. Flying over the Atlantic for a theme park ride? He told me he'd read in the media that the experience was one of a kind and the park had spent $300 million on it. He said some of his countrymen traveled the world to watch their stupid football teams lose, so what he was doing wasn't at all that crazy. You mean soccer? I asked genuinely. What did I know? No, he said, shaking his head in disdain. I mean football. Jeez, I thought, I'm going to have to spend the next few hours next to this guy, and I've already upset him. After about an hour, we saw more and more people join the queue. It was hard to say how many because it wrapped around the corner. In front of us, I'd guess there were about three to 400 people. The time was now about 7 a.m., so there was only a couple of hours to wait before the park opened. But the thing was, I needed to pee. I'd only had those small espressos and I'd barely touched my mocha frappuccino, but I still felt those first pangs of pee pain. You know, the part where you're not quite sure that if you just hit the release button for a second if something would come out. At 9am, we were allowed inside the park and to my surprise, no one tried to cut in line. Every single person was directed toward the ride, with some of us now inside the theme park, and from what I could see, a lot of people still in line on the outside. That made me feel quite proud that we made the decision to wake up so early. The sun was now out, and I was in a bit of a predicament. I still needed that pee. Well, I needed it more, but I was also thirsty. Those beers the night before really had been a bad idea. I decided I'd just take a sip of some Coca-Cola rather than glug down the water. I'd later find out that that decision was a bad one because sweet soft drinks like the coffees I drank are what you'd call diuretics. What are they, you might wonder? Well, the answer is they promote something called diuresis. Okay, so you're still in the dark about this? The simple answer is they make you pee. Pee more than, say, water. Caffeine is the king of diuretics and I just had coffee and coke. I was really holding that pee in at around the 10 a.m. mark, about five hours into our queuing. There were some helpful distractions, such as videos playing with some amusing words from Hagrid, or pictures of the ride itself, and the pretty amazing forbidden forest that had been created. But still, I was now in pretty serious pain. At around the six hour point, I was standing cross-legged and slightly bent over. This seemed to ease the pain as if I were squeezing the tubes where the urine traveled to meet its final destination. What I would later find out after a bit of research was that at that point, I was in danger of weakening my bladder muscles, something which could harm my bladder for the rest of my life. In hindsight, that was the least of my worries. Sure, we were getting close to the ride, I hoped, and I just stood there looking like a man who was slightly demented or had recently been in an accident. My buddy had done the right thing and had just been taking small sips of the water. But to be honest, in his excitement, I really don't think he was that concerned about my predicament. I'd also later find out that the parts of my body that were helping me keep in the pee, now probably a tsunami waiting to happen, are called the urethral cylindrical sphincters. These are great when you tighten them for a short while, such as when you don't want a puddle of pee beneath you on a busy bus, but they're brakes, not doors. They can be worn out. At the seven hour mark, I couldn't overstate how much agony I was in. I knew we were getting close to the ride, so I held on for dear life. That British guy heard me telling my buddy that I thought I was about to pee myself. My friend laughed, but I can tell you it wasn't funny to me. My buddy said that if it was that bad, just go find a bathroom and he'd hold my spot in the queue and you won't believe what happened next. That British guy overheard this and said in no uncertain terms that if I left the queue then I'd have to start from the back. He said he also needed a pee, but in Britain he said there's a thing called queuing etiquette. I think that this guy thought he was special just because Harry Potter is British. That or he was just a xenophobic snob. I can recall his exact words. He said the reason we have queuing etiquette is because if we didn't then there'd be chaos. Queuing chaos doesn't work, he said, and then he went about a time in the past he had difficulty buying a train ticket in India and how he'd almost gotten into a fight at a buffet when hordes of hungry Chinese people fought over the shrimp. He said he wasn't picking on me, only that if order broke down then order would cease to exist. Formal and orderly queuing, he said, in a patronizing way, is the mark of a civilized man. What a total jerk. He told me that if I left the line he'd make a complaint and say I'd cut in line. What I really couldn't believe is that the other people in the line didn't get my back, so I guess one less man in the line was good for them, so they just kept quiet. The words that went through my head were, the milk of human kindness, and then I wished I hadn't thought about milk, gallons of it pouring over pristine porcelain mountains. At that moment, my urethral sphincters almost called it quits. I'll fill you in later, but I'll tell you that I'd already caused myself some damage. 
I was at about the 9 hour point, then we were very close to the ride entrance. I would almost made it, but the problem now was the excitement I felt almost made me lose concentration and loosen those muscles and let all the urine flood out. I had to concentrate, keep the door locked, I kept saying to myself. Everyone was laughing and joking, taking selfies and looking in awe at the ride we were about to go on, and I was undoubtedly the only man in that queue who did not have a smile on his face. If anything, I grimaced, a kind of agonized grimace, like someone who just won the lottery and then been told they only have a week to live. We finally got in the castle, but to be honest, I was in no mood for taking photos. I was hardly even aware at this point if I was actually holding a pee in. It was like I'd gone into survival mode. It felt like my urine had become a hardened prisoner, my entire body was now some kind of detainment unit. That ride itself consisted of Hagrid's motorcycle with a sidecar next to it. I told my buddy that in the interests of me holding the pee, it might be best if I took the bike and he took the sidecar. It was all about control, you see, I needed to feel in control. That British guy was right behind me on the other bike, something he'd regret to this day. At something like 50 miles an hour, we drove past Fluffy the three-headed dog and other such things as Cornish pixies and a centaur. I didn't really care. I just wanted the experience to be over as quickly as possible. This was turning out to be one of the most painful and pointless days of my life and there would be consequences to come. I thought I had it under control, even on the biggest descents and through the sharp bends, but then there was a surprise drop and the heavens burst. The tsunami came. My bladder roared as its doors were kicked down by a violent torrent of urine. My pecker must have been flailing around like an out of control fire hose. Hours of backed up urine gushing from its spout like a great yellow geyser. The pee was everywhere, and it stunk. It was old pee, neglected pee. And when it ejected from me, it spread far and wide. I looked behind me and saw that British guy wincing, looking utterly disgusted. His eyes were glaring into mine. Was I embarrassed, you might ask? No, is the answer. I was relieved, incredibly relieved and almost ecstatic that my British foe had tasted the vapors of an agony he had been an accomplice in creating. I know guys, maybe I shouldn't have felt so overjoyed that someone had to experience great wafts of urine vapor in their face, but you know what? I paid for it. I soon got my karma. When I finally got back to Tampa after a pretty awkward farewell with my Harry Potter fanboy buddy, I felt a stinging pain every time I went to the bathroom to pee. After seeing a doctor, I was told I had a urinary tract infection. That could be cured, he said, and he told me he couldn't believe I'd done a 10-hour urine hole. If there are records, he said, I might have broken some. The bad news, though, was that he said the damage done could be irreversible. He told me that long-term bladder stretching could make it hard for me to pee in the future, and one day if I kept doing this kind of thing, I might have to put a catheter into my member and draw the urine out. On the other hand, all that stress on my bladder could lead to incontinence, so holding in even normal pees would be impossible. I had some blood checks and my kidneys were functioning normally, but he said, when you do anything as crazy as I did, kidney damage can occur, as can the appearance of kidney stones. Just don't make a habit of enduring those marathons, he said. A few minutes is fine, but holding it for hours isn't good for you at all. The one thing he said that really scared me is when he told me that the bladder can actually burst when you hold in a pee as long as I did. He said it was very rare, but it had happened. When it does happen, you can actually die. He told me not to worry though, because the cases he'd heard about all happened to people who already had compromised bladders. He said, like what happened to me, before the bladder bursts, people will just pee themselves. He said cases of healthy bladders just bursting are so rare that he doubted that it could have happened to me. But in the few cases it has happened, urine leaked into the abdomen, and when people didn't get straight to the emergency room, they died. The punchline to this story is that I could have actually told one of the attendants at the park that I needed the bathroom and gotten the green light to go, and he would have made sure I got right back into the queue despite what that British guy might have said about that. So you let things get out of control. The pound seemed to pile on, and it was as if you weren't noticing the changes in your body. Then one day you looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I have really let myself go. Don't worry, that happens to most of us at some point in our life. As we age, love handles appear, the belly grows, there seems to be flaps of flab growing under your arms, and in general, you just don't feel as fit, strong, or flexible as you used to. The other day, you bent down to pick up a fallen coin and pulled a muscle, and you decided it was time to get fit again. Today, we're going to tell you how not only to look good and feel good, but how to get shredded. It's not as hard as you think. We're going to start by telling you a true story of a man that in his prime was a competitive weightlifter, only for an injury to sideline him for quite a long time. 
His couch-bound days transformed his body, and what was once a chiseled physique became an ordinary body replete with bulging belly and a set of love handles a small person could hang off of. Don't worry if you've never been in great shape before like him, because his road back to being ripped is one anyone can follow, regardless of what body shape you have or have had. Although thanks to muscle memory, it'll be a lot easier for him to get back to being shredded than it would if you're not used to exercising. It's all basic stuff and you don't need to be an expert to do it, nor spend a ton of money. What you will have to do is make a plan and stick to it. We're asking you to commit maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day and make some other small changes. The transformation will be noticeable in a short period of time and the payoff will change your life. So first of all, you need to lose some weight. You know this because bending down to tie your shoes is an effort and well, the mirror doesn't lie, nor does your doctor. You might be strong, but it might not be noticeable on the outside. You want to look strong and you also want flexibility back. It's a cliche these days, but it's true. To lose weight, you can't just rely on exercise alone. Many studies have shown that Americans in general are exercising more, but many people are still overweight. Diet is important, and that's an understatement. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a report in 2018, and this was their conclusion. Americans are exercising more, but the obesity rate is growing. The first thing you can do might sound extreme, but it's not that extreme. This is what the former weightlifter did. Go into your kitchen and look at what's in the cupboards in the refrigerator. All those highly processed foods, the stuff with empty calories, you'll throw away or at the very least don't buy them anymore. The chips, the cookies, the stuff you keep snacking on that couldn't be said to be a whole food. These things must go. You want to be eating wholesome foods, raw foods such as chicken, lean beef, vegetables for salads, whole oats, fish, some fruit, nuts, you get the picture. You don't want to be eating those sugary cereals, frozen pizzas, etc. There are a plethora of websites out there that can tell you what healthy foods are, but for now, look at what you have that's highly processed and get rid of it. We're not saying all processed food is bad, but just try and concentrate on eating what we might call nutritious food and certainly cut back on the sugar. We might also add that for many people around the world, intermittent fasting has helped them lose weight. This might mean just having a meal in the evening and then waiting 16 to 24 hours for the next meal. That includes not having sugar in your drinks. This is really not as hard as you think, and some people have even said it's the lazy person's diet because essentially it requires less effort than eating or shopping for food. It might also save you some money. We're not saying that you have to go vegan when you eat or follow a diet that makes it almost impossible for you to eat because of the time it takes you to buy all the healthy foods. It's okay to eat a burger, have some rice, but just go easy on the carbs and get rid of all the food that doesn't have a good calorie versus nutrients balance. This is already enough to make you lose weight, especially with some fasting now and again. One thing we should say about intermittent fasting though is if you have health issues, please check with your doctor before you do it. Now comes the training. If you want to get ripped, you'll need this part, of course, and it will take some effort. Saying that, you'd be surprised just how fit you can get from your own living room. We also suggest that when you can walk, walk. Get in as many steps as possible and do things like take the stairs instead of the elevator if you're not going too high up. If you work sitting down, try and get up every so often, then walk and stretch if possible. We suggest you try to work out six times a week and have a rest day. This can be any day, but sometimes your body will tell you when it's time to take a day off. Out of these six days, you can either have one or two cardio days. We understand that for some people who have packed on the pounds, running for one hour or cycling up a mountain is a big ask. Don't hurt yourself, so just do as much as you can. You can find some experts that will tell you to try to push yourself to 80%. If running is too much, in the gym you have two great machines to start on. These are the elliptical trainer and the rowing machine. Neither machine should stress your joints too much. You can change the settings, but again, why not tire yourself to about 80% of what you can do? Each time you use the machine, add 5 minutes to your workout. If you can row for 1 hour and halfway up the resistance levels, you're doing well. In fact, you really don't need any more than this for a good cardio workout. If you find 10 minutes is hard at rowing, the elliptical machine, or jogging, then just build up until you can reach an hour. Let's also remember that a lot of people will tell you half an hour is good to maintain weight and be healthy, but you're trying to lose weight and get ripped. Now let's say you don't have the time or the money to go to the gym. Well, there are lots of things you can do from your home. You might say a plank a day keeps the belly away, but it could be an exaggeration. But planking at least once or twice a day for as long as you can is very good for you and your shape. 
For ab exercises, you really don't need the gym at all. There are endless home exercise routines you can find online, some of which are free and can be found on YouTube. We warn you though, if you're a beginner, then don't feel bad if you feel pooped before the video even gets going. Some are much more high intensity than others. If you search for Spartan workout videos, you'll find some of these to be hard to follow. We don't mean understand, of course, we mean follow the guy or girl in the video as they take you through the exercises. The good thing is these videos can be seen for free, and they will get you into shape quickly, especially now that you've changed your diet. You might also invest in two things. These are kettlebells and dumbbells. The dumbbell we have known for a long time, and we know what to do with these. Whether to do bicep curls, work the triceps, back, chest, or various parts of the shoulders. But kettlebells, these things are amazing. And fortunately, there are hundreds of possibly thousands of exercises and videos online showing you how these things can make you very strong. All the exercises can be done at home. Follow these exercises and you will burn fat, build muscle, and increase fitness. What about your chest? Well, again, just search to find out how to build your chest up from the comfort of your own home and you'll find scores of articles and videos. The same goes for back exercises. There are many exercises you can do that require no weights. And then, with those kettlebells and dumbbells, there are many more exercises you can do. As with the chest, there are just too many exercises you can do for your back at home for us to mention them all. Google will take you there and you'll find pictures and videos that will help you get it right. We suggest if you follow the high intensity workout videos then you follow their 5 or 6 day plan. If you don't watch those videos and create your own sessions then just do different body parts each day. Remember that you don't have to prove anything to yourself and go all out. Go at 80% and make sure you have perfect form before you add more reps or increase the weight. In all, try and do one hour of these exercises a day. But if that's not possible, start with what you feel comfortable with and just build up to one hour. With these strength exercises covering all parts of your body, as well as one or two days of cardio, plus the change in your diet, we assure you that in six months you will look like a different person. And try to see it this way. Most of us spend one hour a day just wasting time. That time wasted could transform you, give you loads of confidence, and the best thing, stave off sickness and make you live longer. As for the man we talked about at the start of the show, he lost 50 pounds in 6 months and he looked completely transformed. His advice is envision what you will look like in a few months and don't let that vision out of your mind. It's not always easy making the first move, but you'll find that once you start, you won't want to stop. You'll even feel bad for missing a day. Don't worry, everyone gets sidetracked at times, but when you do get going, you'll not only feel better physically, but you'll have more mental clarity. Exercise is as good for the mind as it is for the body. You'll notice a big difference in your overall wellness and ask yourself this. Is one hour a day of making yourself a bit tired worth the effort if you look better and feel better and are much healthier in general? Remember the last time you had a burger? Juicy, beefy, meaty, maybe flame grilled and a little smoky. Or maybe it was a turkey or salmon burger. Remember the delicious flavor exploding on your tongue? Can you trust that the meat patty you ate was actually what it purported to be though? During a series of tests done on ground meat items in the winter of 2012, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland or FSAI discovered the presence of equine DNA in several alleged beef products. In 27 beef burger products tested, just over one-third or 37% were positive for horse DNA, and 85% were positive for pig DNA. Thankfully, in all but one product, the equine presence was at a very low level, about 0.3% horse DNA. However, the frozen beef patty product Everyday Value Beef Burgers sold at Tesco Markets and manufactured by Silvercrest Foods, a subsidiary of huge multinational food processor ABP Food Group, was found to have 29.1% equine DNA as well as pork DNA. FSAI informed the Irish Department of Health and the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine of the results of their tests, and they also notified their British counterpart, the United Kingdom's Food Standards Agency. On January 15, 2013, five retailers who sold the horse-tainted beef products, Tesco, Dunn Stores, Aldi, Lidl and Iceland, were informed of the test results. These five supermarkets and a few other grocery stores ended up removing 10 million burger products from shelves. On January 16, amid widespread media attention and public outrage, four subsidiaries of ABP were accused of supplying adulterated meat. They were Silvercrest in County Monaghan, Dale Pack in North Yorkshire, Freshlink in Glasgow, ABP Nina in County Tipperary, Ireland, and Dairycrest, Rosington. 
Supermarket Tesco immediately dropped Silvercrest as a frozen meat supplier but continued to use ABP as a provider of fresh meat. Over the next several days, the scandal continued to grow as the news set off a chain reaction of meat investigations and testing by several groups and governments. Burger King, for whom Silvercrest was a regular supplier, switched beef patty providers just as a precaution. Other major grocery retailers such as Sainsbury's, Asda, and The Co-op also removed some frozen meat products as a precaution, but later the products were found not to contain horse. However, Asda did its own testing and found 5% fresh horse meat in its personal brand beef bolognese sauce. The sauce was supplied by Greencore, an Irish food company. Greencore said it purchased the meat in their sauce from ABP's Nina plant. Both Greencore and ABP ran tests and couldn't find horse meat in the pasta sauce. However, Asda stood by its test results. ABP especially received a lot of criticism from the media and public. They blamed rogue meat suppliers and claimed their company had never knowingly sold horse meat. On February 7th, Findus, a food company, announced that in a sample of 18 beef lasagna products that it tested, 11 items contained between 60% and 100% horse meat. It also found that there was 60 to 100% horse meat in ground beef items. They traced the source of the tainted meat back to Comagel, a third-party French frozen ready meal producer. The adulterated products had been made by Comagel's subsidiary Tavola at a factory in Capelle in Luxembourg. On February 14th, the French government suspended the license of French meat processing company A La Table de Spangero, claiming that the company knowingly imported horse meat from Romania, relabeled it, and sold it as beef. Meat had been backtraced from France through Cyprus and the Netherlands to Romanian abattoirs. Over a six-month period, Spangero had shipped and sold 750 tons of adulterated meat. One of the companies they sold to was Comagel. However, Comagel wasn't blameless either. Investigators felt that due to inconsistencies in the paperwork and the smell and look of the meat when defrosted, Comagel staff should have realized that the meat was not beef. A number of other companies were also found to have a wide range of issues with their products. Nestle found 1% horse DNA in its Butoni beef ravioli and beef tortellini made by German subcontractor HK Schipka and sold in Italy and Spain. One of the largest private catering businesses in the UK, Sodexo, which supplies 2,300 institutions, including schools, prisons, and branches of the armed forces, had to withdraw frozen beef products after finding horse meat in the sample. In an odd twist upon testing, Jaidekoka 30% beef meat pie, which was sold in Iceland, was found to not contain any meat at all. Pertinent to finding horse and beef products was the worry that the horse meat could contain traces of the veterinary drug phenylbutazone, a common painkiller for horses. Even with above-board production of horse meat, there are regulations that horses treated with the drug cannot legally be used for human consumption. Further testing of horse-tainted beef samples was done by multiple authorities, and thankfully, the presence of phenylbutazone was not found in the majority of product. For samples where the drug was found, the level of contamination was only 1.9 mg per kilograms, a minuscule amount. That's less than one-eighth of a teaspoon per two pounds. The UK's chief medical officer Sally Davies stated that the level of contamination posed very little risk to human health, adding that you'd have to eat around 500 to 600 100% horse meat burgers to receive the daily human therapeutic dose of phenylbutazone. When all was said and done, over $4 million in meat products had been destroyed. Authorities were not able to determine how many citizens in the EU unwittingly ate horse meat. The public was rightfully outraged. Reputations were damaged and the sale of frozen hamburgers fell by 43%. Sales of frozen ready meats containing beef fell by 13%. Executives at various companies pointed fingers and blamed other companies. As a result of the scandal, various countries in the EU began more rigorous testing of meat products and doing more factory inspections. Countries also increased penalties and punishments for those caught selling adulterated meat. Initially, only a few lower to mid-level people in the meat industry were arrested and charged with fraud in the months after the horse meat scandal broke. However, since then a number of arrests have happened, often in joint international stings involving people knowingly selling mislabeled horse meat or selling horse meat considered unfit for human consumption. 
Notably, in July of 2017, the Guardia Civil, Spain's national police, in coordination with Europol, the European Police Agency, arrested 65 people involved in an organized ring believed to be selling horse meat unfit for human consumption throughout Europe. The arrested were charged with animal abuse, document forgery, perverting the course of justice, crimes against public health, money laundering, and being part of a criminal organization. The EU continues to struggle with creating legislation and implementation of systems that fully monitor monitor and trace adulterated and contaminated food products. During the horse meat scandal in Europe, some Americans were worried that the horse meat tainted beef was being sold in the US too. The US Department of Agriculture, or USDA, was quick to reassure the public, saying that adulterated beef was unlikely in the US food supply. Because not only do no domestic suppliers slaughter horses, but the agency has strict labeling and inspection standards for imported meat. However, individual species testing for meat imported into the US is typically only performed when there's a reason to question a shipment. Ultimately, the US has done limited research in regard to species testing in meat products. A 2015 study by researchers at Chapman University's food science program did find that in 48 samples of fresh and frozen ground meat products of various animals, 10 of the samples were mislabeled. Of those, 9 products were found to contain more species than the package label indicated. The 10th sample label was completely inaccurate. Traces of horse meat were found in 2 of the samples. The authors of the study thought that the findings of multiple species suggested the possibility of cross-contamination at the processing facility, that equipment wasn't properly cleaned between the processing of products, so the meat mixed. Also, the study indicates the possibility of lower cost species being intentionally mixed in with higher cost species for economic gain. Unfortunately, since the Chapman study, there hasn't been further testing for various species and meat products in the US. Individual companies and retailers do private testing, but unless a widespread issue occurs, those tests will probably never come to light. Now, if you live in America or in a country that doesn't eat horse meat, you might be a little nauseated by now. We bear no judgment as to whether horses should be eaten or are just for riding. While the idea of eating horse generally grosses out Britons and Americans, once upon a time our countries did eat horse. In fact, during World War II when beef was rationed, many Americans turned to horse meat as a cheap and tasty substitute. Currently, in many other countries such as Iceland, Slovenia, Belgium, Germany, Poland, and China, horse is simply another meat choice. Furthermore, horse is actually considered a delicacy in Japan, where it can be served as sashimi. But all this is besides the point. What the scandal and various studies have revealed is that multinational firms are controlling huge parts of the consumer food chain. Shady decisions made by contractors of contractors, sometimes in different countries, affect what's on your plate. Food fraud is on the rise. A 2014 report estimated that food fraud costs the global food industry 30 to 40 billion dollars US every year. As well as adulterated products, food fraud is also mislabeling products and even obscuring where products come from. Can you as a consumer trust what your food packaging says? In general, misleading or mislabeling packaging seems to be a much bigger problem than potential adulterated mystery meat in America. But why does it matter if your burger which was labeled product of the USA came from Texas or Latin America? A variety of reasons. For example, some consumers have made a decision to only purchase beef that was raised in a place where the rainforest wasn't destroyed to create pasture land for cattle. For others, minimizing the carbon footprint of their food supply chain is important and they'd rather eat meat that was shipped from only a few states away as opposed to flown in from thousands of miles away. Others want their meat slaughtered in a certain way for ethical or religious reasons. Also, there's the simple but very important notion that consumers should be able to make purchasing decisions based on accurate labeling. Current gaps in American law allow cattle and pigs to be slaughtered overseas and imported to the US where they're cut up. Since they're processed in the US, this allows companies to slap a product of the USA sticker on them. How is that possible, you're asking? In 2015, the US Congress voted to repeal laws that allowed the USDA to enforce country of origin labeling or cool requirements for beef and pork products. The World Trade Organization WTO, had ruled that Canada and Mexico could begin imposing more than $1 billion on tariffs of the US products in retaliation for having to label meat products as produced in their countries. They felt that some shoppers would eschew products labeled as having been imported from Canada or Mexico. Worried about tariff issues, Congress repealed 
cool and companies have been using the repeal to their advantage ever since. However, in July of 2019, the current Congress showed some interest in reinstating cool. Beef is not the only protein that's mislabeled in the US. Seafood is frequently substituted and mislabeled. In March of 2019, a marine conservation nonprofit, Oceana, released a new report on the state of seafood fraud in the US. They found that 20% of the 449 fish for sale they tested were incorrectly labeled. To highlight how widespread the issue was, the fish samples were purchased from different retailers in 24 different states and the District of Columbia. Among other findings, the report discussed that the most commonly mislabeled fish were sea bass and snapper. Mislabeling often occurs in the case of cheaper, less desirable imported fish which are sold as local catch and when farm-raised fish were marketed as wild caught. A previous Oceana report found that 59% of tuna sold in the grocery stores and restaurants is not actual tuna, and 87% of snapper isn't snapper. In August of 2019, Philip R. Carawan, the former owner of supplier Captain Neal's Seafood, pled guilty to having his company falsely label and sell over 179,872 pounds of foreign crab meat from South America and Asia as product of the USA making over $4 million in the process. It isn't only meats that are targets of food fraud. According to the U.S. Pharmacopoeial Convention, a nonprofit which helps create standards for drugs, dietary supplements, and food ingredients, the top three adulterated or mislabeled foods are milk, olive oil, and honey. These are often cut with starches, less expensive oils, and corn syrup, respectively. Frankly, the issues we've been discussing are just the tip of the iceberg. By now, you might be thinking that you should raise and slaughter your own beef, catch your own seafood, keep bees, and plant olive trees. For many people, that lifestyle simply isn't possible. So what can you do to ensure that what you're eating is actually what you think you're eating? Educate yourself. Some industries have created committees or task forces committed to ensuring the quality and safety of their products. They sometimes put out reports testing items and touting top quality products for the industry. The olive oil industry has actually created seals that reputable companies can include on their labels, a sign that the product is of good quality. If possible, purchase local. Get to know the sellers at your local farmer's market or co-op. You're less likely to purchase mislabeled imported food there. Also, you can hold your elected officials responsible. Don't be afraid to send an email or a letter to authorities detailing your concerns. Often, the USDA has a comment period where they actively seek public feedback when considering new regulations. Ultimately, you can also vote with your wallet. When possible, don't support companies or retailers who have been revealed to be involved in mislabeling, promoting, or selling fraudulent products. Your body is being hijacked. You're no longer in control. Microscopic entities are flooding through your systems and using your own cells against you. What is happening? How do you stop these foreign invaders? Well, it depends. Let's take a step back and ask, what is attacking you? Is the pathogen a virus or a bacteria? This single question could be the difference between life and death. There are ways to kill bacteria that would not kill a virus and vice versa. So let's take a look at what the similarities and differences are between a virus and a bacteria. Knowing the difference could save your life. Both bacteria and viruses are microscopic, meaning they are too small to see with the naked eye. But they can enter your body through any opening, but most often they enter through the nose and mouth. Are bacteria and viruses living things? This is the first distinction between the two pathogens that we'll make. Bacteria is most certainly alive. In order to be classified as a living thing, something must have five traits. The traits are it's made of cells, it grows and reproduces, it responds to stimuli in the environment, it can pass on genetic information, and it must maintain homeostasis or an internal balance. If just one of those characteristics is missing, it is not considered a living thing. Bacteria meet all of the requirements. They're made of a single cell that divides to reproduce and maintains homeostasis as their environment changes. Bacteria are likely the most diverse kingdom of living things on the planet. There are billions of different bacteria species. Not only that, there are trillions of bacteria in your body right now. Bacteria in your body outnumber your own cells by about 10 to 1. Think about how crazy that is. Just in sheer numbers, there are more bacteria in you than your own cells. Biology is fascinating. This brings up a really good point though. If there are so many bacteria in you, why aren't you dead or at least sick all the time? Aren't bacteria harmful to your body? For anyone who has had food poisoning caused by bacteria, you wished you were dead at the time. Recently, scientists have discovered that bacteria play an important role in making up your body's microbiome. Bacteria are actually beneficial in many ways. They can help you digest foods and keep your skin healthy. We have come to realize that bacteria actually make your life better. 
Without a healthy microbiome of bacteria in your body, you wouldn't be able to eat certain foods and you'd become sick more often. We now know bacteria are living things. They are single-celled and they have all of the characteristics of life. They are diverse and found everywhere around the world. Bacteria can be harmful, but they are also beneficial to your body. So, are viruses the same way? The short answer is no. Viruses and bacteria have more differences than similarities. Let's start with what seems like a basic question. Are viruses alive? Well, it's complicated. Depending on who you ask in the scientific community, you will get different answers. Viruses are in a gray area between living and non-living things. For example, they cannot reproduce without hijacking the cells of a host. This means they don't really have the characteristics of reproduction. All other living things can reproduce without taking over another organism's cells and using it for their own purposes. Living things either find a mate and reproduce, like humans, or split in two using a form of asexual reproduction, like bacteria. Viruses can't do either of these things. Another characteristic of a living thing is that they respond to their environment. Viruses, again, are in a weird gray area where they don't so much respond to their environment as change it. Viruses change the genetic code of cells to suit their needs. They can cause cells to make copies of themselves, along with protein shells that carry them to new cells to infect. Viruses are tricky both in the ways that they use our cells against us and identifying if they are a living thing or not. Bacteria, on the other hand, will respond to their environment. They'll make more copies of themselves when there's an abundance of resources or swap their genetic code with another bacteria around them if a beneficial trait arises that helps the species survive. Evolution by natural selection also is an important concept when discussing living things. All living things evolved from a species in the past. You, me, bacteria, we all evolved from an organism that started life on this planet billions of years ago. Granted, you and bacteria went through many different changes and evolutionary steps. But humans and bacteria both evolved from earlier species. This is just how life works on our planet. Viruses again blur the line here. Viruses most definitely do change over time. This is why you have to get a different flu shot every year. Although viruses are missing several characteristics of a living thing, they do seem to evolve. And they seem to evolve fast. Species evolve when a mutation in DNA occurs that gives an organism a new trait. Mutations are random mistakes in the DNA. Some are good and some are bad, and some don't have any effect on an organism's survival at all. But with viruses, it would seem mutations happen so often and so rapidly that a new form of a virus can evolve almost overnight. Are bacteria living things? Yes, they are. Are viruses living things? Eh, they straddle the line between living and non-living. Us humans like to make things clear-cut and binary, either yes or no. Unfortunately, viruses don't fit into one category or another, which can scare and frustrate us. So, we talked about the benefits of bacteria, but you may be wondering, do viruses give us any benefits? Or are they just little hijacking machines that make us sick? Well, one benefit of viruses is that weak or less harmful ones can help boost your immune system. If you get the common cold, it makes you a little sick. Your body may develop a resistance to a more malicious virus with a similar genetic makeup. In this case, your body would be better able to fight off the new virus thanks to the weaker virus that you got earlier in your life. But let's talk about one of the coolest benefits a virus can have for you. Let's talk about bacteriophages. A bacteriophage is a virus that kills bacteria. It targets a specific type of bacteria, infiltrates it, takes it over, and destroys it. It's pretty awesome when you think about it. Like little microscopic warfare happening inside your body. Imagine you have a harmful bacteria multiplying away inside of you. It's making you sick and causing a lot of distress. Then, a virus that has been laying dormant in the mucus lining of your gastrointestinal tract awakes from its slumber. The viruses start attacking the harmful bacteria by injecting them with their genetic code and taking over. Eventually, the bacteriophages kill all the harmful bacteria and are either evacuated from your system or lie dormant again, waiting for their next victim. That is pretty cool stuff if you ask us. Bacteriophages are viruses that only kill bacteria, so they pose no threat to your cells. As of yet, we know of no bacteria that kills viruses, but there are countless different viruses that kill bacteria. There is one last aspect of viruses that make them unique and different from bacteria. And we promise that biology is fascinating, and if we haven't already delivered, we are about to. When viruses infect us and hijack our cells, they can embed small chunks of their DNA into our DNA. Although this is rare, it has been happening for millions of years. So over time, the viral DNA that snuck into the human DNA has accumulated. Your DNA right now is actually comprised of around 10% virus DNA. Think about that. One-tenth of the genetic code that makes you is actually virus DNA. 
Like mutations, the chunks of viral DNA in our genome were inserted randomly. Some is harmful, such as viral DNA that can cause cancer. Other pieces of viral DNA have been beneficial to us humans over our evolutionary history. There's evidence that some of the virus DNA in our genome helped the development of the human placenta. Also, if you enjoy eating cereal, bread, or any other food high in starch, you can thank viruses for providing humans with the gene that allows us to digest the complex sugar. Viral DNA is responsible for creating starch-digesting enzymes in our pancreas cells. Without virus DNA in our genome, we would all be on a starch-free diet right now. Bacteria are beneficial to humans in lots of ways, most especially in shaping our microbiome and digestion of food. However, only viruses can claim the honor of changing our DNA and influencing the course of human evolution. Have we mentioned how cool biology is yet? Now let's talk about the differences in preventing or killing viruses and bacteria. The first and most important distinction to make when treating a pathogen is to identify if it's a virus or bacteria. This is important because only certain medicines work for certain types of pathogens. Antibiotics are used to kill bacteria. Antibiotics will only kill bacteria, hence the name anti meaning against and biotic meaning living. So antibiotics are only used to kill living things, in this case bacteria. Since viruses are complicated and don't reproduce using cellular division, antibiotics have no effect on them. It's important that you can distinguish between viruses and bacteria to make informed decisions about medication being recommended for an illness. We all know bacteria are living things. All living things are subject to the pressures of natural selection. When the environment of a bacteria changes, let's say an antibiotic is introduced, the bacteria will be killed by it. That is, unless a random mutation allows one bacteria to become resistant, and therefore able to fight off the antibiotic. If this happens, that species of bacteria will keep on multiplying and could lead to severe illness or death. Antibiotic resistance is a process that's driven by natural selection. The bacteria can literally evolve in your body to become resistant to antibiotics. This is why it's so important to take the correct dosage for the correct amount of time when prescribed antibiotics by your doctor. Even if you stop showing symptoms, you must complete your antibiotic regimen because if you don't, the bacteria you were trying to kill are more likely to develop resistance to that antibiotic. We see this in certain parts of the world with tuberculosis. Like we've said, living things tend to evolve over time. Otherwise, that species would go extinct. Bacteria are no exception. So if antibiotics only kill bacteria, how do we kill viruses? There are two types of medicines that doctors use. The first is antiviral medication. The drugs must be administered within a certain time frame and are only effective while the medicine is in the patient's system. When you travel to areas of the world with yellow fever, you can take an antiviral yellow fever drug. You have to take the pills as prescribed by your doctor before and during your trip in order for the drug to be effective. The antiviral uses chemicals that kill the virus, but only if those chemicals are in your system when the virus infiltrates your body. Vaccines can be used to prevent or kill both the virus or bacteria. Every vaccine is different and made to kill one type of pathogen. Vaccines typically use a weakened or dead form of the pathogen to activate the immune system. When the weakened or dead pathogen enters your body, your immune system identifies it and makes antibodies that mark it for destruction. After your immune system comes into contact with the vaccine, it'll remember what the virus or bacteria looked like. So if you're ever infected with the actual pathogen, your body already has immunity to it. Then your immune system will do what it does best and destroy the pathogen before it can make you sick. Vaccines work the same way against bacteria and viruses. We've learned a lot over the years about viruses and bacteria. We know that they have some similarities but are also different in many ways. It is thanks to scientists and doctors that we know so much and can protect ourselves from harmful pathogens like bacteria and viruses. It's also thanks to scientists and doctors that we understand the importance bacteria and viruses can play in human evolution and health. What it comes down to is that biology is cool and scientists are awesome. And that's why when scientists and doctors recommend certain precautions to prevent a disease, we should all listen. If you eat leftovers, you will die. You could of course also be perfectly fine and suffer no ill effects whatsoever. But unbeknownst to millions of people all over the world, last night's harmless leftover steak and potatoes can harbor secret threats. And yes, a chance that you could actually die. All because you decided to skip the rest of your main course and dive straight into dessert. But why are leftovers so potentially dangerous? And what foods are more dangerous than others? Stay tuned as we explore why and how cold potatoes can and will end your life. 
From the moment a searing steak leaves the pan and hits your plate, bacteria start to invade it and multiply at alarming rates. You may keep a spick and span kitchen, but germs are a persistent bunch and can survive even harsh cleaning chemicals. Also, countless studies have shown that most people don't wash their hands nearly thoroughly enough to make a dent in the populations of bacteria, happily making your digits their home and hearth. What's all that really mean, though? Well, you know that plate you hand washed? Soap alone without appropriate friction is pretty lousy at killing off bacteria, so odds are that with the lazy two or three passes you gave it with the sponge, most of the bacteria that were feasting on your leftovers are still there. Your sponge itself, by the way, is practically bacteria nirvana, and most dish sponges are teeming with all sorts of stupidly dangerous bacteria. Every time you wipe your plate with a dirty sponge, you're less cleaning it and more simply smearing more harmful bacteria around, ensuring that they'll find their way onto your food and into your body. Then of course, there's your filthy hands and the billions of germs they come into contact with every day on various surfaces. Be honest with yourself. When's the last time you washed your hands before eating? We thought so. Keep that in mind next time you're chowing down on a burger at a restaurant and reach for that same sticky bottle of ketchup hundreds of people before you have manhandled before going back to pawing their burger buns. Scientists caution that you should limit the amount of time food is in the danger zone or between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. These are the temperatures in which bacteria grow best, and every second your food spends in this danger zone is more bacteria you'll soon be ingesting. Our advice is to simply flip food straight from the red-hot pan and into your mouth to be safe. The searing burns you'll receive will destroy the bacteria that are already inside your mouth and throat, because yes, harmful bacteria even live there. See, even your own insides aren't safe. But suppose you're like most people and enjoy a leisurely meal while watching another new episode of Stranger Things, and then after you're done eating you realize you have plenty left over for tomorrow. In that case, you probably do like just about any normal person and stick the leftovers in Tupperware or perhaps wrap them in plastic wrap and stick them in the fridge. Congratulations, now you're probably going to die. But wait, because if you must eat leftovers, then there's ways to make sure that you limit the hazards of spoiled food. First, you should be aware that the fabled smell or taste test are not a valid means of ascertaining if food is still good to eat. Most bacteria simply don't smell or taste like anything, even in really large numbers. And so food that smells, looks, and tastes perfectly fine could be in fact teeming with bacteria waiting to murder you. The FDA recommends that you keep leftovers for no more than four days, after which even if they're kept refrigerated, they should be tossed out. If you freeze food, you can safely do so for three months, after which the bacteria society will have acclimated to an ice age civilization and begun to thrive once more. Actually, no, it's because generally speaking, food tastes terrible after three months. Though many sources warn about the dangers of eating food frozen for too long, we're gonna call BS on that, seeing as on January 17, 1951, attendees to the Explorers Club's 47th annual dinner ate 250,000-year-old mammoth that had been frozen in permafrost. If you insist on gambling with your life and eating leftover food, though, the most important thing to remember is to cook your food until it reaches an internal temperature of at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit to ensure you kill off any surviving bacteria. If cooking in a microwave, remember to turn your food regularly and even flip it to ensure that it gets cooked regularly. Slow cookers such as crockpots are very bad ideas for reheating leftovers, as they often won't heat food hot enough to actually kill bacteria. But what kinds of food should you never reheat? Aside from all of them, the following are particularly risky. Potatoes are pretty much the best vegetable in the world. It makes up the better half of burgers and fries and can be fried, baked, mashed, steamed, and seared without tasting terrible. Unfortunately, potatoes are not as friendly as they seem, and for centuries they've been plotting their slow revenge on mankind for the way we dump their brethren into pots full of hot oil and baking ovens every day. While a normal uncooked potato is pretty harmless, once potatoes that are cooked are left to cool at room temperature, they can begin to form the bacteria which causes botulism. And this is especially true if you wrap the potato up tightly in foil so as to keep oxygen out. Botulism can be so resilient that even reheating the potato may not be enough to kill the bacteria off. Next time you decide to go out for dinner, we recommend you order the french fries, because it's us or them, and we have to eat them all before they wipe humanity out once and for all. 
Most people love having mushrooms on their pizza, and these people are not your friends because fungus is not a food. However, if you happen to be a filthy fungus eater, you should be aware that after cooking mushrooms and then leaving them to sit at room temperature, proteins in the mushroom can be damaged and broken down by enzymes and bacteria. This can give you a pretty upset stomach, which isn't as metal as potatoes literally breeding botulism to try and kill you before you can eat them, but still unpleasant. Chicken is great for your health, and every doctor will recommend a healthy chicken diet over consuming lots of red meat. Yet, when it comes to reheating, chicken is an absolute nightmare of bacterial overgrowth. If you do reheat chicken, you must ensure that it's evenly heated to at least 175 degrees, and it must never have been allowed to dip above 42 degrees while stored in the refrigerator. If your chicken has been stored for longer than three days, just forget about it and toss it. Scientists are unsure why chicken is so dangerous compared to other meats, but have agreed it's probably due to the same glitch in the matrix that causes most foods to taste like chicken because the machines have no taste buds. Chicken clearly is out to murder us, and its attempts to end mankind begin even before it's hatched out of its egg. The FDA recommends that you never leave cooked eggs out of the refrigerator for more than two hours, or one hour in hot weather. Salmonella multiplies stupidly fast in eggs and can leave you with a serious case of the Hershey squirts, or even be fatal. The two-hour, one-hour rule, by the way, applies to any dish with egg in it, to include quiche and even casserole. Salmonella doesn't discriminate. If a dish has so much as a hint of egg in it, it's going to jump right in and start binary fissioning all over the place. That's the asexual process of bacterial reproduction, by the way. So next time you're staying in a hotel and they have eggs on offer at the breakfast buffet, just skip on them and then call the police, because that hotel just tried to kill you. Who hasn't reheated Chinese food leftovers in their day? Well, people who don't want to die, that's who. It turns out that rice is also extremely hazardous to your health if eaten as a leftover, and that's because cooked rice can become contaminated by a bacterium called Bacillus cereus. While the bacteria itself can be destroyed with appropriate heating, it's able to produce spores that are very heat resistant and toxic to consume. So while you may have killed off the actual bacteria, their children are hidden amongst your rice grains, waiting to wreak revenge upon you for the deaths of their fathers. Sort of like a food Taliban, if you will. If you have to eat leftover rice, make sure that you reheat it thoroughly. And if microwaving, that means taking it out, stirring it up, and sending it in for another round of microwave radiation. But let's be real. You know you have literally never done that before in your life because nobody does. We just scarf down the boiling hot food at the top of our dish and try to mix it with the freezing cold food at the bottom. Ain't nobody got time for proper food reheating techniques, but you should make the time because after you die due to food poisoning, you'll definitely not have the time. If chicken is bad, seafood is worse. In fact, the FDA recommends that you immediately toss out seafood if it's been left out for more than two hours in cool weather or one hour in warm weather. Turns out the bacteria absolutely love growing on seafood. And unless the fish or shrimp you're enjoying was caught and then immediately frozen, you're probably in for a very long stay in the bathroom if you try to reheat old seafood. Even worse, it's basically impossible to tell when the seafood has gone bad because, well, it always smells like it's gone bad, even when fresh. Take it from us and just stick to eating land animals. Man was never meant to enter the briny depths of Poseidon's realm, and doing so is likely to end up with the mighty god of the sea smiting you with explosive diarrhea. Most of the food we featured in this episode has been meats, which probably leaves plenty of you vegetarians feeling pretty self-satisfied at your lifestyle choice right now, convinced of your own immortality versus carnivores. Well, you leaf eaters should think twice, because it turns out that reheating root and leafy vegetables is potentially just as, if not more, fatal than reheating old chicken. Spinach, lettuce, cress, and celery, to name a few, are vegetables rich in nitrates, which happen to be pretty good for the body. However, when you reheat one of these vegetables, the nitrates can convert into nitrosamines. And these are well-documented carcinogens. Sure, old chicken could make you spend the next day and a half on the toilet, but spinach will straight up give you cancer if you reheat it. Think you're safe because you only eat kale and sunshine? Think again, not only does kale taste terrible, but it also is silently biding its time, waiting for you to make the mistake of reheating it as leftovers so it can unleash deadly carcinogens into your body. It turns out that eating leftover food is a pretty terrible idea, and some everyday dishes that we never thought of as harmful can be pretty deadly even if properly reheated. 
After watching this episode, we wouldn't blame you if you opted to never eat leftovers again, but then again everybody knows that day old pizza is the best. While one takeaway from today's episode is that we should only cook or order enough food to satisfy a normal sized appetite and not gorge ourselves on dangerous leftovers afterwards, another is that food is dangerous and constantly trying to kill us, so we should eat as much of it as possible because at this point it's either us or the food. This planet isn't big enough for both of us. Let's set the scene for your upcoming death. You're lying in bed, surrounded by family and friends. The lights are dimmed and your breathing is shallow. The people around you know it's almost time. You might seem unconscious to them, but in your mind all kinds of things are happening. Images of childhood come back to you. You're selling lemonade on the street outside your house. Then you're a teenager holding hands with the person who was your first love. You fast forward to adulthood and you're saying I do with the woman who was your first wife. A decade later, you're doing the same routine with your second wife. And then the scene fades to black, except there's a light ahead of you. Death is calling and you walk forward, or is that how things happen? Or is there nothing during those final few minutes? Having your life flash before your eyes might seem a little too romantic for some. Maybe we don't get this last picture show right before death, and all we're left with is the lights going out. That's it, game over. No great trip through history with the Grim Reaper acting as the tour guide. In 2017, a neurologist named Dr. Cameron Shaw shed some light on those final 30 seconds before the final bell goes. He explained that before we die, right before, there will be blood loss to the brain unless there's some massive injury and it lights out immediately. Before we die, we're going to fade out because of this lack of blood to the brain. When that happens, the vision narrows, so right before death, we may well experience something like going down a tunnel. That's perhaps why a lot of people who have died and come back have talked about tunnels. He added, though, that he doesn't believe in out-of-body experiences, only that loss of consciousness might feel like a narrowing of vision and then blackout. The doctor was asked what happens during those final 30 seconds, and he replied that, we slowly shut down, and the bits that shut down first are the parts of the brain that make us us. That's our sense of self, perhaps our humor. After that, the parts of the brain that shut down are the bits where we store memories. You're then still alive for a few seconds, but the doctor said you're pretty much in a vegetative state. This is how he explained it in an interview. For all intents and purposes, you could say they're dead because they don't have a consciousness or an awareness of their surroundings, but if these basal structures are intact, they'll still breathe and have a pulse. Still, people report seeing all kinds of things near death. Some researchers at Hadassah University in Jerusalem, after interviewing people who had near-death experiences, concluded that indeed some people had their lives flash before their eyes. They said that the life might not flash in any type of sequence, though, only lots of muddled memories that have flashed through the brain of the almost dead. One woman explained it like this, it all happened at once, or some experiences within my near-death experience were going on at the same time as others, though my human mind separated them into different events. Then we might look at the story of Dr. Rajiv Parti, a man who is the former chief of anesthesiology at the Bakersfield Heart Hospital in California. He was having an operation for his cancer when things went horribly wrong. He didn't die, but was close. He since written about what he saw during those seconds he was leaving the planet. He wrote, My father led me down the tunnel toward the light, and we looked at it together, its intensity oddly soothing. I moved forward and then began to walk rapidly in its direction, pulled by a powerful sense of love emanating from its radiance. My father let go of my hand, and I kept moving forward. That doesn't sound too bad at all. And then he said he entered another realm where he met archangels of the Bible. He said they took him to a place where he saw this. The sweet smell of grass and roses made me almost delirious with pleasure. A crystal clear stream of water cut through the meadow, and the air off the distant mountains was blowing gently. He said he felt pure love in this new land, and he was ready to leave the old land of his former life. That sounds like a massive hallucination, perhaps close to something someone might see on the substance DMT. Psychology Today wrote a story about near-death experiences, but like the doctor we introduced at the start of the show, the writer said a lack of oxygen to the brain might only feel like a tunnel and then you're gone. Tripping in a land of angels and green pastures should not happen. So why do so many people say they see such things? If the brain is dying, we shouldn't really be seeing majestic things, it should be the opposite. This is where DMT comes in. Full name, NN dimethyltryptamine. This stuff is sometimes called the spirit molecule, and if you watch Joe Rogan, you'll know he and a lot of other people, while erring on the side of caution, believe this stuff can open a doorway to another kind of reality. DMT is everywhere, in plants and in animals. It's illegal in most countries when it's made into a powerful drug, but in other countries it's taken as part of ceremonies. If you listen to what people say about a thick soup called ayahuasca is like, it's nothing short of unbelievable. DMT is part of that drink and sends people into an 
another reality. If you know anything about DMT, you'll know a lot of people say we humans can produce it all on our own, with some people saying it's responsible for these great dreams we have. Others say as we die we might produce a lot of it. Indeed, scientists at the University of Michigan said the mammal brain can make its own DMT. In a now famous documentary called DMT The Spirit Molecule, a clinical psychiatrist called Rick Strassman said upon death DMT can be secreted by the brain's pineal gland, and we might have a mystical experience. This is all quite controversial, but it might explain angels, roses, and eternal love. A bunch of researchers at the Psychedelic Research Group at Imperial College London wanted to get to grips with such mystical experiences near death. They began a study, and people on that study all had near-death experiences. In the study, they took DMT and then were asked to compare their trip to their near dying. It turned out there were similarities. One of the researchers concluded, our findings show a striking similarity between the types of experiences people are having when they take DMT and people who have reported a near-death experience. Scientists are still trying to figure this out, and while some are sure rats create DMT in their pineal gland, others are not so sure humans can do it. More research needs to be done. Another scientist who has studied near-death experiences did say, though, that the experience is often transformative. People who have taken ayahuasca or plain DMT have said the same thing. This is what he wrote about people who have had near-death experiences, and it really does sound like someone who's just come back from Peru following a five-day ayahuasca marathon. He wrote about near-death experiences. A person's values and attitude toward life are completely transformed. People often become less materialistic and more altruistic, less self-oriented and more compassionate. They often feel a new sense of purpose, and their relationships become more authentic and intimate. They report becoming more sensitive to beauty and more appreciative of everyday things. He went on to say that a lot of people do have have those mystical experiences before death, and indeed, they might be a massive hallucination. But he said DMT experiences are not nearly as transformative as near-death trips. There are a lot of skeptics out there, but some people believe that consciousness is a part of the universe at large, and not something just in us. Perhaps when we die, we feel this connection to everything else. Perhaps DMT helps us to realize this connection. The jury is still out, but it's not something we think should be laughed at. So we might trip out before death, and if we survive, survive, it might change us forever. We found plenty of stories online in which people said they had a wonderful experience at near death. They were so very willing to go, they said, it was peaceful. Some described it as beautiful, so if you believe them, then we all have something to look forward to. Science is still in the dark about this, and while a dying brain should not give us these amazing experiences time and again, people have said that that's exactly what happened to them. We went to a Reddit thread where people talked about what happened to them during their near-death experiences. Here are a few of the replies. To me, it felt a bit like slipping into a dream. Everything in the dream feels and looks bright and colorful. It feels like a last hours, but when I came back, I'd only been gone for less than three minutes. The subject of the dream or anything about it, I didn't remember. I knew none of it made sense, but it felt peaceful, almost uplifting. There's no excitement or struggle or really any awareness of what's going on. You just sort of kind of fade and slip away. Everything is kind of insubstantial, like it's there but not. You sort of know something's not quite right, but somehow that's not important. It felt as though I was sinking into a deep dark pool of water. Everything around me was black and the world we live in kept getting smaller and smaller. It was like I was sinking slowly into a world of unknown. Known. Sound began to act as though it was farther and farther away. In a strange way, I felt at peace. While some scientists say our dying brains should be slowly becoming more inactive, one scientist said this to the BBC. A lot of people thought that the brain after clinical death was inactive or hypoactive, with less activity than the waking state, and we show that that is definitely not the case. If anything, it's much more active during the dying process than ever with the waking state. But more research has shown that some people don't have those illuminating experiences and during their near-death experience, all they got was pretty much nothing. Another doctor who was interviewed by Live Science said some people who have come back from the dead said they saw people in the room. He said they'll describe watching doctors and nurses working, and they'll describe having an awareness of full conversations, of visual things that were going on that would otherwise not be known to them. He said we still don't know exactly what goes on with consciousness as we die, but there is enough evidence out there to suggest more than fading to black might take place. So to conclude about what happens in the mind before we die, it seems a lot of people do enter another kind of realm, and some feel at peace. It seems some people do see the past, memories of their life, while others don't think about much at all. We can only ask those who have come close, of course, because the dead tend to be quite tight-lipped. By the way, we thought we'd add something to the end of the show because it's relevant and it's just so fascinating. 
We might also make a show about this in the future. Did you know that doctors of late have started putting people into suspended animation? Like keeping them suspended in death and then bringing them back? This recently happened at the Maryland School of Medicine in the US, and the doctors called it emergency preservation resuscitation. What they did is cool the person down by replacing some of their blood with an ice-cold salt solution. This prevents oxygen from getting into the brain, but the person can be brought back to life. The reason the doctors would do this is so they can perform a medical procedure on someone. Let's say that a person has been shot or stabbed and they go into cardiac arrest. They've lost lots of blood and will die in about 5 minutes, so that means surgeons have to work very fast. But with the suspended animation technique, they might get 2 hours to work on the person. They're technically quite dead, but are brought back. We'd love to know if anything was going on in the patient's mind, but unfortunately this is all new, and their thoughts weren't in the articles that we read about this. The US Food and Drug Administration has just given this the green light, and those surgeons don't even need to get a person's consent before they do it. Let's say you don't properly store and refrigerate a bologna sandwich and decide to go back to it a week later. Tastes a little funny, but you think nothing of it until later, when you're dealing with headaches, memory loss, nosebleeds, aches and pains, and even changes in moods. You've come down with a nasty case of mycotoxicosis, and you got it from ingesting mold. And yet, treating yourself to a slice of blue cheese, which is brimming with a mold known as Penicillium roqueforti, is considered perfectly safe. Classy, even. So what's with the double standard? Why can moldy cheese make you look refined and moldy bread or mold in your home make you seriously sick? And come to think of it, what even is mold? What are the different varieties? What effect can different kinds of mold have on your body? And what mold myths and misinformation are lurking out there? That's exactly what we're going to find out. First question, what is mold? It's a term that's thrown around a lot, but rarely properly explained. Typically, it's associated with filth, grime, and decay, and there's some truth to that. But unlike your typical dirt, mold is very much alive. It's a fungus, much like yeast or mushrooms, it can grow pretty much anywhere. This includes plants, wood, fabric, soil, food, drywall, floors, and ceilings. While you're probably used to encountering this pesky fungus in your home, it serves a much wider function in nature as a kind of natural recycling system. It plays a crucial role in the decay of organic matter. Without mold, we'd all be knee-deep in dead plants, animals, and people. So what does mold look like? How can you recognize it? It's important to note that if you can actually see mold, you're looking at a sizable colony of it. Mold exists on a microscopic level and grows in clusters until these clusters become large enough to be visible in the human eye. The physical size of a mold colony is referred to as its fungal biomass. Molds will appear as spots or smears in the colors black, blue, and green. These colors can depend on factors like the source of the mold's nutrition or the age of the colony in question. Mold often gives off a musty, stale odor too, so if you seem to be noticing strange smells around your home or on your food, it's better to be safe than sorry. Molds aren't a monolith either, with over 100,000 different species across the globe. These can be organized into some wider categories that we'll break down for you later, especially the most dangerous ones. But all these species have certain qualities in common, like the way they reproduce. Molds, like almost all fungi, reproduce asexually, meaning with themselves rather than with a partner, by releasing spores. Anyone who's played the popular The Last of Us game series wherein the world is taken over by a zombifying cordyceps fungus knows that spores are not to be messed with. These are single-cell reproductive units, invisible to the human eye, that drift through the air in hopes of landing in a new place suitable for colony growth. This is how, when left to its own devices, mold can spread fast and take over buildings, leading to horrifying results like these. If that sent a chill down your spine, you're probably wondering, what exactly are the ideal conditions for mold and how can I avoid them? We're sorry to inform you that the most basic requirements for mold growth are oxygen, moisture, and some source of nutrients, all of which are pretty much present anywhere. Temperatures between 40 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit are also known to be the sweet spot for unchecked mold growth. These rules are the same whether you're talking about mold growth on food or around the home, though of course it's a lot easier to throw out moldy food than fix a moldy home. Let's look a little closer at the factors that make your home right for a total mold takeover. First, nutrients. Mold can feed off of wood, drywall, and fabrics, making most places in your home susceptible to fungal invasion. Next, moisture. Here's a scary fact. Mold growth sets in 24 to 48 hours after initial water intrusion, so things can get real bad real fast. How can water intrude? Often without you even noticing it? Here are just a few examples. 
condensation, such as on windows or in your bathroom after showering, leaks from damaged roofing, leaky plumbing, poor ventilation, or even high environmental humidity. Bathrooms, basements, and attics are often particularly susceptible to mold, so that's where you'll want to keep an eye on it if you want to nip the situation in the bud. However, while you're watching like a hawk for potential fungal threats, it's worth noting that there's another common household phenomenon that's often linked to mold – mildew. Mildew is a term often generically used for various types of mold, but the technical difference is a little more specific. Some describe mildew as early-stage mold or particularly mild mold. While it can be a terror to plants inside a home, it generally poses less of a risk to a home's human inhabitants. It's also a lot easier to treat than more advanced cases of mold infestation. And that's because household mold is a hardcore pest. Like a lot of problems in life, prevention is better than cure. The US Environmental Protection Agency recommends reducing moisture and humidity with good ventilation and by keeping an eye out for condensation and plumbing leaks. If you take away the moisture, you've struck a serious blow against the mold's ability to reproduce. If you fail to prevent a major infestation of household mold, though, you're likely to be in for some major consequences. Best case scenario, you have to pay thousands of dollars for a professional mold decontamination crew to chemically treat the affected areas and get them back under control. Worst scenario, the mold infestation causes the structural integrity of the building to take a turn for the worse, forcing you to find a new place to live. Worst case scenario, being exposed to mold for prolonged periods of time can have seriously negative impacts on your health. Let's take a look at the types of mold you're likely to encounter on your food and around your home, school, or place of employment. You can broadly categorize dangerous and unhealthy molds by the effects they have on people. These three categories are allergenic, pathogenic, and toxigenic. Allergenic molds are the least harmful and typically only cause mild irritations in those allergic to the specific strains of mold in question, or those with other sensitivities like asthma. Pathogenic is a little more serious. These molds can cause adverse effects even on otherwise healthy people. This type of mold can cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis, an acute response resembling bacterial pneumonia, and finally, toxigenic molds. These are the most actively dangerous of all mold varieties and, in the right circumstances, they can produce mycotoxins and aflatoxins, neither of which you want anywhere near your body. These can lead to severe health consequences like irreversible damage to the lungs and immune system. Toxic spores can be inhaled while in a high mold environment, ingested on moldy food, or even absorbed into the body through skin contact. When it comes to knowing whether your run-in with mold is some indigestion or a trip to the ER, it all comes down to what species of mold you're encountering. Some of the most common molds around the home are Alternaria, an allergenic mold that forms around damp areas. Aspergillus, one of the most common, is typically allergenic but some strains can produce deadly aflatoxins, capable of causing cancer in humans. And Stachybotrys, also known as the infamous black mold. It's feared for its high capacity to produce mycotoxins, which can wreak havoc on human health, especially if the people in question are asthmatic, allergic, or immunocompromised. However, just to make sure we're not causing you to lose any sleep tonight, it's worth noting that black mold isn't quite as scary as its reputation suggests. While a black mold infestation in your home obviously isn't a good thing, studies have shown that links between black mold exposure and serious illness is overblown. You're much more likely to become seriously unwell from black mold if you ingest it on food. Outside of the home, the two most common molds you're likely to encounter are Fusarium and Cladosporium. Fusarium is a common soil fungus typically seen on plants, but it may find its way to your carpet and infect your eyes, skin, and nails. Cladosporium is found on decaying plants, woody plants, food, straw, soil, paint, textiles, and the surface of fiberglass duct liner in the interior of supply ducts. It's also been connected to a large number of health issues from causing skin lesions to intrinsic asthma in children. Don't mess with mold, kids. And finally, let's talk about mold on food. What to expect and why mold on certain types of cheese, like blue cheese, is considered a delicacy rather than a sign of decay. Pretty much all food with any degree of moisture from meats to breads to vegetables to cheese are susceptible to mold. This is because the foods themselves provide ample nutrients for the molds to metabolize and grow. Breads, in particular, can be a host to an impressive variety of different molds. This is because of the rich organic materials found in it. Sugar and carbohydrates especially fuel the growth of mold spores. The main varieties of bread mold are Rhizopus thalonifer, aka black bread mold, penicillium mold, and cladosporium mold just like the mold we discussed earlier. While a number of these molds are unlikely to hurt you, it's better to be on the safe side and throw out any food exhibiting any kind of mold growth. 
One exception, of course, being cheese. The reason that cheese seems to defy everything we know about mold is because of the particular type of mold that cheesemakers cultivate, that being molds from the Penicillium family, such as Penicillium rocaforti and Penicillium glaucum. The combination of acidity, salinity, moisture, density, temperature, and oxygen flow in cheese prevents the mold from becoming toxigenic. Instead, the mold gives cheese, like blue cheese, a distinctive bitter flavor loved by connoisseurs. And as you can probably tell from the name, penicillium molds allow us to produce the antibiotic penicillin, which has saved millions of lives since its discovery in 1928. Unlike a lot of foods, hard cheeses also allow for developing mold colonies to be quarantined and removed. Unlike a lot of foods, if a non-benign mold begins to develop on hard cheese, that part can be cut off without affecting the rest of the cheese. The same cannot be said for soft cheese or any other food, where visible mold indicates it's embedded deeper into the overall structure of the food. In other words, if one slice of bread or one part of a vegetable is moldy, you're better off tossing everything it was touching just to be safe. Food that wasn't made moldy intentionally, like the handful of artisan cheeses we've discussed here, are best kept separate from mold. And the same can be said for your home and your body. When it comes to most kinds of mold, your best bet is to keep your distance. But when it comes to blue cheeses, well, bon appetit! Hello, Infographics fans! Once more, we're concerned about your health. Obesity rates are finally starting to come down across America. But while the Battle of the Bulge may have started here in the USA, it's spread around the world. Today, modern nations are all battling obesity, as our overprivileged first world lifestyles make life easy and convenient. All that convenience comes at a cost, though. And while the world may have laughed and snickered at the US's weight problems, now it's them eating a double serving of humble pie, as populations all over Earth are having to add a few extra holes to their belts. But what can you do to help keep your weight down? And what if you want to start losing weight? Once more, we're tasking your favorite and our least important guinea pig with finding out in this special challenge episode of the Infographics Show. Lose 10 pounds in one month. Day 1 It feels so bizarre to say this, but thank God for a normal challenge for once. I mean, by comparison, losing 10 pounds in one month is a cakewalk, or a healthy alternative to a cakewalk, rather. At least compared to wearing makeup in public, telling absolutely zero lies for a week, or walking on your hands for 30 days. And no, that last one isn't some secret challenge episode the infographic show is waiting to release. I'm just making a point about the level of insanity the producers over at the Infographic Central have been cooking up for the last year. Not gonna lie, this challenge even feels a little necessary. As most of you know by now, I run some of these challenges concurrently because the infographic show sadly realized that there just isn't enough months in a year to torture me with. Typically, the challenges don't overlap as far as their effects, but let's just say the last few challenges have had me vegging out a lot and, well, the pounds have crept up on me. That probably doesn't make any sense for our younger YouTube audience that routinely sits on the couch playing Fortnite and devouring sodas and bags of chips all day long without gaining a pound, but just wait until you approach your late 20s and early 30s. Oh man, you have such a rude awakening coming up. Enjoy your blissful ignorance of calories while you can. So even though this challenge seems pretty easy, it's gonna hit me hard because if there's one thing I hate, it's dieting. I don't eat terrible food all too often, but when I get a craving, I want it, and I want it now. And for the next 30 days, I'm not allowed to touch anything that will add a single extra calorie to my diet. I decided that I would try four different meal plans for the next month, one each week, and record my weight loss and maybe get an idea of which worked best. For the first week, I'm going to go largely on a liquid diet which means a lot of juices and smoothies and as little solid food as possible. That's going to make for some fun poops," he said very ironically. For the second week, I'm going to go all vegetable, and right now I'm going to tell you that I'm considering this my hell week. It's not that I don't like vegetables, it's that they are C-SPAN level boring. For the third week, I'm going to try something a little less drastic and instead stick with fish, vegetables, and fruits, limiting the bread and pasta that I eat, and I'm a big fan of both of the latter. Finally, for the fourth week, I'm just going to let the girlfriend cook her heart out and eat whatever she makes. I can tell this challenge really excited her, and as I was making up my plans, she looked about ready to burst, practically begging me to let her take over one of the weeks. I'll be recording my weight loss, how I feel, and my thoughts about what I'm eating. Spoiler alert, I'm probably going to hate all of it. End of week 1 This was the juice and smoothie week, and when I weighed myself tonight I found that I lost 2.9 pounds. I've read that weight loss and dieting is more of a state of mind than a physical act. 
and individuals who stick to a plan where they lose 1-2 to two pounds a week tend to continue successfully dieting. I guess that's because whatever plan they're on, it's one that they can live with as opposed to something really drastic and flat out unbearable. In that regard, I guess I'm pulling slightly ahead of the curve. I mostly drank juices and smoothies, but I did have a few regular meals in between because I'm not an animal. On date night I had a pretty big dinner, and halfway through the week I made pasta for both me and the girlfriend, so that definitely pushed the calories. But I guess all of that juice and smoothie drinking paid off and counteracted the weight gain. As far as doing this long term, unless you're a big juice person, I'm not sure that it's totally realistic. I tend to get very bored with juices, and when I make my own smoothies, I always get yelled at by the girlfriend for adding way too much sugar. She says I'm making milkshakes, not smoothies, but I've just never been a huge fruit person myself and I need something extra to help it along. Physically, I feel fine. Although I'm not going to lie, liquid diets really leave me craving solid food. The first few days, it was all I could do to keep myself from rushing to the nearest burger joint and eating myself into cardiac arrest. One week down though, see you guys in 7 days. End of week 2. Several special operations military training programs have a period of time referred to as Hell Week. This is typically close to the end of your training, and it's when you're pushed to your mental and physical limits, and then right over them and far beyond anything you thought you were capable of. Or you just get washed out, one of the two. This last week was my Hell Week. Vegetables are my Everest. So for the entire week I ate nothing but vegetables, just to see what the difference would be between the different diets. I included fruits in there as well because I'm not a total maniac, but for the most part lunch and dinner were vegetarian. It's not that vegetables are terrible tasting, they really aren't, it's just that they're, well, vegetables. I mean, I don't know, there's something deep in my programming that says vegetables don't compute. I don't need to eat meat all the time, but my brain refuses to believe that vegetables alone are enough to satisfy hunger. I can literally fill my stomach until it's bursting, and my brain will absolutely not acknowledge the fact that hunger has been fully sated. But if I even eat just a moderate helping of pasta or something non-vegetable, then my brain is like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, that's enough to fill us up. I lost 3.5 pounds this week, but the entire week I felt physically weak and emaciated. Vegetables are amazingly nutritious and full of vitamins and energy and all that crap, but as far as my body is concerned, I might as well have been eating cardboard. Even my performance during my regular workouts was far worse than before, and I'm starting to think it was all mental. It's like a car with a governor on it that keeps it from going faster than 55. Green beans are my governor and keep my physical energy in the pits, or maybe it's just that by feeding it nothing but vegetables every day my body simply found no reason to continue living and wanted to throw in the towel. I don't know, but I do know that going strict vegetarian is impossible for me. Two weeks down, two to go. End of week 3. I guess this week was what I would call a pescatarian or someone who adds fish and seafood to a normal vegetarian diet. Of the three diets so far, this was the most palatable and I actually feel pretty decent after losing 2.1 pounds. I've never been a huge fan of seafood, but fish fillets is pretty close to real meat and I think it helped to make the entire experience more livable. Then there's the fact that I was allowed to eat shrimp and clams, and while I'm not a big fan of seafood overall, I love shrimp and clams. On date night me and the girlfriend went to eat sushi since it was one of the few options that are allowed in the rules and everything else was just basically fried fish or shrimp or whatever. I happen to like sushi, which is weird because I know it's starting to sound dubious when I keep saying that I don't like seafood, but really I don't. Yet sushi is different. Maybe I just don't like cooked seafood, which would make sense considering my brain's very weird positions on different foodstuffs. Tuna steak? No thank you. Gross and fishy. Tuna roll? Yes please. Straight into my tummy. Anyways, this week wasn't so bad, but it was by no means enjoyable. I miss desserts. And there's literally nothing that makes you want a nice big piece of cake less than after dinner fish burps, but I guess maybe that's the point. End of week 4. Hallelujah! The end is here. Four weeks of insane diets finally done, and with this week's weight loss of 1.8 pounds, I've officially hit the goal of 10.3 pounds lost. So this was the week that I let the girlfriend take over my meal planning, and I really hate to admit it, but she made this last week the most bearable of all. 
There were no gimmicks this week, instead I basically just ate what she already eats on a daily basis. The focus was not on sticking to specific foodstuffs or not eating groups of things, but rather on portion control. We ate pretty much the same things we would normally eat with the exception of breakfast. Typically she eats bowls of fruit and I make myself a bowl of sugary cereal or scrambled eggs, but this week she had me eating fruit one day and then a moderate portion of what I wanted the next. For lunch and dinner we stayed away from red meat and ate a lot of chicken and pork, but the difference is we focused on smaller, more appropriately sized portions. I even got desserts! Within reason of course, and all of them were low fat or sugar free, which is fine because after weeks of hell even sugar free ice cream tastes delicious to me. My mood was pretty good the whole week, probably better than it's been all month to be honest because I wasn't forced on some gimmicky diet that was making me miserable. Instead I got to eat things I legitimately enjoy, even if the portions weren't quite as satisfying as I wish they would have been. I think that's the hardest part about portion control, having the self control to limit yourself to only eat what you should instead of stuffing your face until you burst. My weight loss this week was the least of all weeks, but I feel like it was the healthiest and it was definitely the most satisfying. Realistically speaking, I could see myself doing this successfully for weeks at a time, but eating nothing but fish or vegetables or juices is all but impossible. It might not have gotten the biggest results, but it was definitely the diet most likely to stick, and it left me feeling the best afterwards. For anyone following at home, I highly recommend portion control and of course exercise. You're just not going to lose much weight on dieting alone, and I wouldn't have hit my goals without it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to physically dive into a man-sized chocolate lava cake to celebrate the loss of 10 pounds I'm about to immediately put back on. You'll often hear inspiring headlines about one in a million surgeries pulled off by talented surgeons and dedicated nurses, improving or even saving the lives of patients. But for every dream come true, there's always a nightmare. We're talking about the real hack jobs, sawn off limbs, tangled tubes, horrifying body cavity souvenirs and even one exceptional case, a surgery with a 300% mortality rate. If you're eating, now is the time to stop, because we're about to get nasty, weird, and gross. These are some of history's most insane surgical mistakes. While things are arguably much better now, medical malpractice was horrifyingly common far more recently than you think. Harvard University conducted a study into New York hospitals in 1991, finding that 1 in 25 patients were victims of medical malpractice. But thankfully, even then, the cases we're talking about today are exceptional, and exceptionally horrible to boot. There's even a term for them in medical lingo, never events, meaning things that should never happen, but they do, and all too often in fact. First, let's talk about the horrifying case of mistaken identity. When people are given surgeries intended for others due to egregious clerical errors, take 81-year-old Bimla Nayar. For instance, she was supposed to receive surgery for a jaw displacement in Oakwood Hospital, Michigan. However, she was about to experience something a whole lot worse. Doctors at the hospital mixed up Nayar's CT scan with that of another patient and mistakenly assumed that she was experiencing bleeding from the brain. Nayar was rushed into brain surgery immediately, sawing the right side of her skull open only to find no bleeding. When the surgery was over, Nayar needed to be kept on life support in a comatose state for 60 days. When her recovery was deemed extremely improbable, the ventilator was turned off and Nayar died all because of a damaged jaw and extreme medical negligence. Unsurprisingly, her family filed a lawsuit and was awarded $21 million. Back in 1995, Dr. Ronaldo R. Sanchez was a menace to anyone who liked keeping their limbs. In the first of his two nightmare surgeries, Dr. Sanchez was amputating a patient's leg. However, halfway through the surgery, he noticed that his nurse had begun to cry. She tearfully told him that he was amputating the wrong leg, and Dr. Sanchez was furious. He blamed pretty much everyone but himself, including his team, and even said that he hadn't done anything wrong because the leg he was cutting off was also diseased and he probably would have needed to do it anyway. Incidentally, nurses in Tampa, Florida have figured out a method for preventing this kind of wrongful amputation, writing the word NO on the arm or leg that isn't meant to be amputated. It's very Florida, but hey, if it works, it works. Dr. Sanchez would return to perform another feat of epic medical malpractice before finally losing his medical license. Mildred Schuler needed some infected tissue cut from her right foot in what should have been a very simple operation, but Dr. Sanchez always liked to go above and beyond. He took the entire big toe on Mildred's right foot, insisting it was necessary. The medical board insisted that it was necessary Dr. Sanchez no longer be allowed to practice shortly thereafter. In April 2015, 49-year-old Edwifes Rodriguez also found herself missing some pieces, 
After finding a lump in one of her breasts and going to the hospital about it, she was misdiagnosed with breast cancer and had one of her breasts removed in a hospital in Manhattan. However, analysis on the severed breasts instead discovered that the lump had actually been a benign growth and that the breast did not, in fact, need to be removed. Though, to play devil's advocate, it's generally better to be safe than sorry when it comes to breast cancer. Speaking of sorry, a hospital in Lebanon, Tennessee needed to apologize profusely to Nate Melton and his mother Jennifer after a pretty heinous mix-up. Nate Melton was literally one day old when he became the recipient of an unneeded phrenectomy, otherwise known as a tongue clipping surgery. This procedure cuts the tissue that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Nurses came to take Jennifer Melton's brand new baby away for what she thought was a standard checkup, only to find, to her horror, that the doctor was performing surgery. As you probably guessed already, he had been mixed up with another patient. Jennifer got her lawyers involved shortly after. During the 2010s, a doctor from Sheffield, UK proved to be a serial surgical bungler. In a more minor act of medical stupidity, he removed a skin tag instead of a cyst. However, in a more severe example of malpractice, he botched two different appendectomies. In the first, he simply removed some fat from a woman who needed the surgery, leaving her in terrible pain until the second surgery could be performed. But even that pales in comparison to a 2015 incident, where during an appendectomy he removed a woman's ovary and fallopian tube during the surgery. He said in his own defense that the organs looked very similar to an appendix due to his poor eyesight. The UK medical board could see a little clearer and decided to permanently ban this negligent doctor from treating patients again. We can all rest a little easier now knowing that the guy won't be handling a scalpel at work anymore. But here's the thing, while we are all probably feeling a little paranoid about an incompetent doctor sawing off the wrong limb or taking out one of our perfectly healthy organs, it's not always what these screwy surgeons take that's the problem. Sometimes the issue is what they accidentally leave behind. This may seem like a rare incident, but it's actually upsettingly common. There are several thousand instances of medical supplies being left behind in patients after surgery every year, and that's in the United States alone. Though with the cost of healthcare, you'd probably want to get some freebies with your surgery. The grand majority of the medical equipment left inside patients is medical gauze and sponges, but in the minority of cases, actual surgical tools are left behind. In one incredibly bizarre case, a man from the Czech Republic somehow had a foot-long pipe left inside his body after surgery, which then needed to be removed a month later in a subsequent surgery. In another paranoia-inducing case, Air Force Major Erica Parks had just given birth with the help of an emergency C-section. However, unlike most people who'd just given birth, her stomach continued to grow. She also became severely ill and began to experience abdominal pain. She was rushed into surgery only for doctors to find the culprit. A surgical sponge from the earlier C-section had become wrapped up in her intestines, swelling and becoming infected inside her body. It took a six-hour surgery to finally remove the sponge. It would have been easier to just not leave it in there. Even hearing about some of these cases can be cringe-inducing. A man undergoing treatment for cancer in Wisconsin somehow had a 13-inch surgical retractor left inside his body. A woman undergoing surgery for a uterine cancer had a small pair of surgical scissors left inside her body. A woman undergoing a hysterectomy once somehow even had a whole surgical glove left inside her body in the aftermath. Much like Major Parks and the surgical sponge, these cases can be incredibly dangerous as well as uncomfortable and painful because foreign objects left inside the body can massively increase risk of infection. But if you think everything you've heard before was bad, trust us, it can always get worse. What comes after will make a stolen toe or a misplaced scalpel seem like a pleasant medical experience by comparison. We're warning you, this next one is probably the most disgusting surgical mistake on this list. Put down that sandwich, or you're really going to regret it. The story of a 31-year-old Chilean woman named Yasna Cortez Caceres hit headlines in 2018 after she signed up for a basic fallopian tube tying operation in Culique Hospital, Central Chile. As a mother of four children already, Ms. Caceres wanted to put her reproduction on hold until further notice. However, the surgery was botched in a particularly horrifying manner after two cuts in her large intestine caused a fistula to develop. And that's as unpleasant as it sounds. A fistula is an abnormal connection forming between two hollow spaces in the body. In this case, there was an unnatural overlap between her intestines and her reproductive organs. The result is that Ms. Caceres was suddenly defecating through her vagina. A gross and embarrassing problem that also led to her needing to buy over $100 worth of colostomy bags every single day. The employees at Quilique Hospital did apologize profusely for their mistake here and have been providing subsequent surgeries in hopes of solving the problem. 
We don't actually have any details on that, so we can only hope that Ms. Caceres is satisfied with the results. Personally, we just wish we could forget about it. And finally, the most insane surgical mistake of all, the legendary surgeon with a 300% mortality rate. How is such a thing even possible, you're probably wondering? It definitely wasn't easy, but an exceptional mistake takes an exceptional surgeon, and the 19th century Scottish master of amputation, Robert Liston, was truly exceptional. You see, in the early 1800s, anesthesia wasn't all that popular in surgery, so grisly procedures like amputations were performed while the patient was still conscious. This is as horrible as it sounds. There was lots of screaming and thrashing involved, and every surgery required a team of strong assistants to hold the patient in place. Given that undergoing this kind of surgery was horrible, short surgeries began to equal successful surgeries, and Liston was famed for being the fastest amputator in the UK. He even had the cocky catchphrase, time me gentlemen, before he took the sawing. He could apparently even take off a leg in two minutes, which for using a handsaw on a screaming, wriggling patient is pretty damn impressive. But it was his legendary off day that allows him to endure in the history of surgical weirdness. During this fateful surgery, Liston was doing his thing, sawing like a madman to remove his patient's leg as quickly as possible. However, an assistant got too close and accidentally lost a few of his fingers to Liston's masterful blade work. Earlier that same surgery, Liston accidentally cut into the clothes of an elderly surgeon supervising the expert butchery. While Liston hadn't actually cut the old surgeon, he was still covered in blood from the messy surgery and assumed that Liston had suffered something important. The old man collapsed and died of a heart attack on the spot. That's fatality number one. Fatality number two was the death of the assistant who'd lost some fingers. Apparently, the saw was less than clean, resulting in the assistant's later contracting gangrene and dying from his infected injuries. Oh, and as the cherry on top of this excessively bloody cake, the patient didn't pull through either. Three people dead, one surgery. Liston managed to pull off the only surgery with a 300% mortality rate, an achievement he was probably less proud of than his impressive cutting time. So there you have it some of history's bloody, disgusting, and downright insane surgical mistakes. In case you're thinking of putting off your next doctor's appointment after this, don't sweat it. These cases are the exceptions rather than the rule. But hey, if you do find yourself on the receiving end of a horrifying surgical mistake, at least you might make the next video. As one of the leading causes of hospitalization for both children and adults, it makes sense that pneumonia is top of mind, especially during flu season. We know that pneumonia is dangerous, especially for elderly people and people with other health issues. But what actually is pneumonia? We've all heard about pneumonia before, but if you're not quite sure exactly what it is, you're definitely not alone. Understanding pneumonia can be tricky because it's not just one disease, but a family of diseases. There are many different types of pneumonia, and the symptoms, treatment, and outcome for each type can be dramatically different. No wonder it's hard to pin down exactly what pneumonia is. First, the name pneumonia comes from the Greek word pneumon, which means lung, and ea, which means disease. And that's exactly what pneumonia is, a disease of the lungs. During a pneumonia infection, the air sacs in the lungs, called alveoli, become inflamed and can fill with fluid or pus. This inflammation makes it hard for oxygen to make its way into the bloodstream. Pneumonia is no joke, it's a leading cause of hospitalization for both children and adults, and flu-related pneumonia was the eighth leading cause of death in the US in 2016. Sadly, pneumonia is the single leading cause of death among children under 5 years old worldwide. According to the World Health Organization, in 2017, pneumonia caused 15% of all deaths in children under 5, killing more than 800,000 children that year alone. That means more than 2,200 children died of pneumonia every single day. And it's not just children who face the deadly consequences of pneumonia. More than 2.5 million people worldwide died from pneumonia in 2017. The death toll is highest in poorer countries. The 2017 death rate in Europe was around 10 deaths per 100,000 cases, while poorer countries in sub-Saharan Africa experienced a much higher death rate of 100 deaths per 100,000 cases, 10 times higher than the European death rate. Age is another huge factor in the mortality rate of pneumonia. 119 out of every 100,000 children under 5 with pneumonia will die. The death rate is even higher for older populations. 261 out of every 100,000 people over 70 who are diagnosed with pneumonia will die each year. Although these numbers have improved in recent decades, they are still incredibly high. Although many cases of pneumonia are relatively mild and the chances of recovery are high, especially in developed countries, the death rate for severe cases is staggering. 
staggering. Up to 30% of severe cases that require intensive treatment will result in death. On top of socioeconomic and age factors, there are other risk factors that can make some people more susceptible to pneumonia and more likely to experience severe symptoms and complications. Pre-existing health conditions, especially lung or heart issues like COPD or lung disease, can increase the severity of the infection and the risk of complications. Someone with a compromised immune system, like a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy treatments, will have a harder time fighting off an infection that could lead to pneumonia. Just being in the hospital to be treated for another health condition can increase the risk of developing pneumonia, especially if the treatment involved the use of a ventilator. Difficulty swallowing, whether due to a past stroke, dementia, other health issues, or even intoxication, can put someone at a higher risk for pneumonia, as fluid can be inhaled into the lungs. Other lifestyle factors can also increase the risk of complications from pneumonia, including smoking, air pollution, and malnutrition. Understanding pneumonia can be complicated because there are many different types of pneumonia. One of the main ways that healthcare professionals categorize pneumonia is by how it was acquired. Community-acquired pneumonia is an infection that occurs outside of the hospital setting. Although pneumonia itself is not contagious, the virus or bacteria causing the infection can spread from person to person the same way most viral or bacterial infections spread, through contact with infected people or surfaces, especially through respiratory droplets released when an infected person coughs or sneezes. It may also spread through blood, especially during and after birth, which is why pregnant women are considered high risk during flu outbreaks. When the immune system is weak, it has a harder time fighting off these infections. Even worse, the bacteria that already live in the respiratory system can start to grow out of control and cause pneumonia. Hospital-acquired pneumonia is an infection associated with previous healthcare, especially ventilator use, or with hospitalization or residence in a nursing home where infections can spread like wildfire. Hospital-acquired pneumonia is usually much more serious than community-acquired pneumonia and has a much higher mortality rate. Another way to differentiate between the types of pneumonia is by whether it affects both lungs, as in double pneumonia, or just one lobe, as with lobar pneumonia. Still, more categories of pneumonia exist, including walking pneumonia, which is usually a milder form of the disease that doesn't require treatment in the hospital. Aspiration pneumonia is caused by inhaling fluid into the lungs, and if you aren't able to cough up the fluid, bacteria can take hold in your lungs and lead to infection. Fluid can enter the lungs in a number of ways, from accidentally inhaling your food instead of swallowing it, to experiencing a near drowning, to even inhaling vomit especially risky for intoxicated individuals. There are so many different kinds of pneumonia because there are nearly as many things that can cause the inflammation of the lungs that is the trademark of pneumonia. Pneumonia can be caused by bacteria, fungi, or viruses, all three microorganisms that are too small to see with the naked eye, but they're all very different. Bacteria normally live all over our bodies, and many are harmless or even helpful. Some bacteria can give off toxins as they reproduce, which causes disease and symptoms. Fungi are parasites that decompose and give off an enzyme that help them absorb organic matter. Viruses need a host cell to be able to replicate, and as they insert their genetic material into the cells, those cells can burst and die or turn malignant. The most common type of bacterial pneumonia is pneumococcal pneumonia. This type of pneumonia happens when the Streptococcus pneumonia bacteria, that normally makes its home in our upper respiratory tract, reproduces uncontrollably. Legionnaire's disease is a very dangerous type of pneumonia caused by the Legionella pneumophilia bacteria, which is usually contracted from contaminated water from cooling towers or even pools and whirlpools. Although we can thank vaccines for all but eradicating tuberculosis from most developed countries, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria can still cause a rare form of tuberculosis pneumonia that is highly resistant to treatment. Bacterial pneumonia can occur on its own or develop after a viral flu or cold infection. It often only affects one lung, making it a lobar type of pneumonia, and fungi found in soil and bird droppings can also cause pneumonia, although this is most common in those with chronic health issues or a weakened immune system. Pneumonia can also be caused by viruses, and the flu virus is the number one cause of viral pneumonia, which is why we hear so much about pneumonia during flu season, especially during particularly bad outbreaks. As the virus invades the lungs and reproduces, it causes pneumonia symptoms, but it may not show the same physical damage as bacterial pneumonia. Most viral pneumonias are less severe than bacterial pneumonia, but flu-related pneumonia can still be very serious and even fatal. Viral pneumonia is most dangerous for people with pre-existing heart or lung issues and pregnant women. There is also the risk that the viral infection could trigger a second bacterial pneumonia invasion. 
Bacterial pneumonia tends to cause the most severe symptoms and require the most medical care. The symptoms of bacterial pneumonia can come on suddenly or develop more gradually, but symptoms of viral pneumonia usually develop over the course of several days. Typical pneumonia symptoms include a fever and chills, a phlegmy cough, shortness of breath, and rapid shallow breathing, chest pain, loss of appetite, and fatigue. Symptoms can be mild or severe, and not everyone experiences the same symptoms. For example, very young children may also experience nausea and vomiting, and some elderly people may not even have a fever, so confusion and mental changes may be the only way to tell that something is going on. There is no one-size-fits-all test to diagnose pneumonia. Instead, doctors typically start with a physical exam, including listening to the patient's lungs with a stethoscope. They may also order a chest x-ray to measure inflammation in the lungs, or a pulse oximetry test to measure the oxygen level in the bloodstream. Blood and mucus tests can be done to identify the particular germ responsible for the pneumonia infection. If symptoms are severe, doctors may order a CT scan to check for complications or perform a bronchoscopy to look into the patient's airways and see what's going on. Treatment for pneumonia depends on the type of pneumonia and the severity of the symptoms. Bacterial infections can be treated with antibiotics, which work by stopping or slowing the growth of bacteria. Although this seems like a simple treatment, it can be complicated to decide when to use antibiotics. Overuse of antibiotics can lead to an anti antibiotic resistance, and many infections, including pneumonia, are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics, which is why the death rate from pneumonia has not improved much over the last 50 years, despite the widespread use of antibiotics. Unfortunately, antibiotics do not work on viral infections. Some antiviral drugs exist, but treatment for viral pneumonia is mostly about managing the symptoms. Symptoms like fever can be treated with medications like aspirin, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Drinking lots of fluids can help prevent dehydration and warm beverages, hot baths, and a humidifier can help open the airways. Pneumonia sufferers should get plenty of rest and give themselves lots of time to fully recover from the infection. Most of the pneumonia symptoms will resolve after a few weeks, but some, like fatigue, can persist for weeks or even months. It can take six to eight weeks to fully recover from a case of pneumonia and return to normal levels of functioning. Even once the infection is passed, a bout of pneumonia can have long-lasting effects like future lung disease. Mild cases of pneumonia can usually be treated at home. But the more severe cases, especially hospital-acquired pneumonia, will require treatment in the hospital. Healthcare professionals will provide intravenous fluids and antibiotics, oxygen therapy and symptom management, while also keeping an eye out for complications. Serious cases of pneumonia can quickly turn dangerous, which is why it's so important to be under the care of professionals in a hospital setting. Severe pneumonia can cause dangerous and life-threatening complications. The biggest danger is that the patient will go into respiratory failure and require ventilation to help them breathe. Acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS can occur after the lungs have experienced trauma, like a pneumonia infection. As fluid leaks into the lungs, they become smaller and stiffer and breathing becomes very difficult, starving the body of oxygen. There is no treatment for ARDS. All that medical professionals can do is help the patient get enough oxygen with the help of a ventilator and give their lungs time to heal. Other potentially serious complications from pneumonia include sepsis, which is uncontrolled inflammation throughout the body that can cause multiple organ failures. Lung abscess can also be a concern and surgery may be required to drain them of fluid. Complications are more prevalent and more serious in patients who are very young or very old or have pre-existing health issues, especially heart and lung diseases. Now that you know how serious pneumonia is, especially for the elderly and the sick, you can do your part this flu season by washing your hands regularly, always covering your mouth when you cough or sneeze staying at home when you're sick and maintaining distance when you're out and about. Even if you think you're strong and healthy enough to handle a bout of the flu or even a case of pneumonia, remember that pneumonia is a serious infection and even young, healthy people can be taken out by it. Besides, it's not just about you. The last thing you want is to be the reason someone's grandma ends up in the hospital on a ventilator. If you thought this video was enlightening, be sure to check out our other videos, like this one, called The Most Painful Illness Known to Man. Or perhaps you'll like this other video instead.